Talmud, Mosim Yurei C-H-A-P-T-E-R I mission all persons can exchange men as well as women not that one is permitted to exchange but that if one did so the substitute is sacred and he receives 40 lashes Gemara the mission contains a contradiction in itself you say all persons can exchange implying that it is permissible to exchange in the first instance and then it says not that one is permitted to exchange implying only after it has been done but how can you understand it at all? Persons can exchange in the first instance in that case instead of bringing a contradiction from the Mishnah you could rather bring it from the scriptural verse since it says he shall not alter it nor change it Rab Judah therefore said what the Mishnah means is this all persons can affect and exchange men as well as women not that one is permitted to exchange but that if one did so the substitute is sacred and he receives 40 lashes what additional case is included by the word all it includes the case of an heir and the Mishnah will not be in accordance with the view of our Judah for it has been taught an heir can lay hands on the head of a sacrifice an heir can affect exchange with his father's dedication this is the teaching of our Meir whereas our Judah says an heir cannot lay hands on the head of a sacrifice nor can an heir affect exchange with his father's dedication what is our Judah's reason we infer the case of a preliminary act in the dedication from the case of a final act in the dedication just as in the case of the final act an heir cannot lay hands on the head of a sacrifice so in the case of the preliminary act an heir cannot affect exchange with his father's dedication and how do we know this in the case of laying on of hands itself three times the expression his offerings is used one intimates that his offering requires laying on of hands but not that of a gentile one that his offering but not that of his fellow and one his offering but not his father's dedication but as for our Meir who rules that an heir can affect exchange with his father's dedication surely his offering is written he needs this in order to include partners in a sacrifice as requiring to perform laying on of hands and what does our Judah say to this he does not hold that partners in a sacrifice must perform laying on of hands what is the reason because their sacrifice is not designated or if you prefer another solution I may say that our Judah may Still be of the opinion that partners in a sacrifice must perform laying on of hands but he derives the cases both of the sacrifice of a Gentile and a fellow sacrifice from the one text there is left over therefore one text from which we derive that partners in a sacrifice must perform laying on of hands and as to our mayor who rules that an heir can exchange with his father's dedication what is his reason he can tell you scripture says and if he shall at all change to intimate that an heir can change Talmud, Mastim Yerubi we infer then the case of the final act in the dedication from the case of the preliminary act in the dedication just as in the case of the preliminary act an heir can affect exchange with his father's dedication so in the case of the final act an heir can lay on hands and what will our Judah do with the text and if he shall at all change it is to include the exchange by a woman and as it is taught since the whole context of exchanging speaks only of it. Masculine gender as it says he shall not alter it nor change it whence do you derive that the same applies to a woman the text therefore states and if he shall at all change in order to include a woman and whence does our mayor derive that a woman can affect an exchange he derives it from the Bob and, and what does our Judah say to this he does not interpret the Bob now according to the view both of our mayor and of our Judah the reason why the law of substitution applies to a woman is because scripture expressly included the case of a woman but if it had not included it I might have thought that when she exchanged she was not punishable with lashes surely Rab Judah reported in the name of Rab and likewise Atana of the school of our Ishmael taught scripture says when a man or woman shall commit any sin that men commit scripture thus places woman on a PAR with man in respect of all the penalties mentioned in the Torah you might be under the impression this is the case only as Regards a penalty which applies equally both to the individual and the community but there since the penalty does not apply equally in all cases for we have learned a community or partners cannot affect an exchange therefore in the case of a woman also if she performed an exchange she would not be punishable with lashes hence we are informed that this is not so Rami Biham asked can a minor affect an exchange what kind of case do you mean shall I say it is the case of a minor who has not yet reached the stage of legal vows surely there should be no question about this for since he is unable legally to dedicate how can he affect an exchange rather the cases that of a minor who has reached the stage of legal vows do we say seeing that a master said scripture could have stated when a man shall utter a vow of persons why then does it say if a man shall clearly utter a vow it is in order to include a doubtful person next to a man and that his dedication is valid now do we say that since he can dedicate he can affect an exchange or perhaps since a minor is not punishable he cannot affect an exchange and if you were to maintain that a minor can affect an exchange since ultimately he comes into the category of being punishable can a gentile affect an exchange should we say since he can legally dedicate an animal for sacrifice as it has been taught scripture says a man a man of the house of Israel what need is there for scripture to repeat man it is in order to intimate that the gentiles can make vote of free will offerings like the Israelites do we say that they therefore can also affect an exchange or perhaps since they never come into the category of being punishable do we say that when an exchange is performed by them the animal is not sacred said Rabbah come and here for it has been taught no secular use may be made of the dedications of gentiles but the law of sacrilege does not apply to them nor are these subject to the law of pickle. Nahar and uncleanness Gentiles cannot affect an exchange nor can they bring drink offerings but the animal offering of a Gentile requires the accompaniment of drink offerings these are the words of our Simeon our Jose said in all these things I favor the strict view this applies only to things dedicated for the altar but with things dedicated for their value to be used for temple needs a law of sacrilege applies at all events the very this says Gentiles cannot affect an exchange. And what does Rami Bihama say to this my inquiry does not refer to a case where a Gentile dedicates an animal for his own atonement my inquiry has reference to a case where a Gentile dedicated an animal so that an Israelite may be atoned for by its sacrifice do we go by the person who consecrates or by the person for whom atonement is made but why not solve this question from what our Abuah said for our Abuah reported in the name of our Yohan and only he who dedicates must add a fifth and he who is to procure atonement can affect an exchange and if one separates the priestly due from his own grain Talmud, Mastim Yura for the untithed grain of his fellow the power of disposing of it belongs to him who separated what does Rami Bihama say to this there as the dedication came through the agency of an Israelite we go by him to whom atonement is made and thus both the beginning and the end are in the hand of an Israelite but here the question is do you require that both the beginning and the end should remain in the control of one who can affect an exchange or not the question remains undecided the master said no secular use may be made of dedications of a Gentile but the law of sacrilege does not apply to them the ruling that no secular use may be made of them is rabbinical and that the law of sacrilege does not apply to them is biblical what is the reason it is written if a soul commit a trespass and sin through ignorance we draw an analogy between the Word sin here and sin mentioned in connection with Teramah and with reference to Teramah it is written the children of Israel intimating but not Gentiles nor are these subject to the law of pickle nut and uncleanness because in connection with uncleanness it is written speak unto Aaron and unto his sons that they separate themselves from the holy things of the children of Israel and that they profane not my holy name etc and we infer that nut does not apply to the dedications of Gentiles by means of an analogy between the word profane and the word profane mentioned in connection with the law of uncleanness with reference to uncleanness it is written the children of Israel and that they profane not etc and in connection with nut it is written therefore everyone that eat that shall bear his iniquity because he hath profaned the hallowed things of the Lord and we derive the case of pickle by means of an analogy between the word iniquity and the word iniquity Mentioned in connection with Nathar for in connection with Pickle it is written and the soul that eateth of it shall bear its iniquity and in connection with Nathar it is written therefore everyone that eateth it shall bear his iniquity for he hath profaned the hallowed things of the Lord and so in connection with all these cases we apply the text the children of Israel but not Gentiles Gentiles cannot affect an exchange because it is written he shall not alter it nor change it and earlier in the context it is written speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them when a man shall clearly utter a vow of persons thus referring to the children of Israel and not to Gentiles another version Gentiles cannot affect an exchange what is the reason there is an analogy between the exchange of an animal and the tithing of animals and there is also an analogy between animal tithing and
must be some resemblance to Terima which is dedicated as such but with things dedicated to be used for temple needs which are dedicated for their value the case is not so Rav Judah reported in the name of Rav in the case of every negative command mentioned in the Torah the transgression of which involves action is punishable with lashes but if it involves no action it is exempt from lashes and is as a general rule that a negative command the transgression of which does not involve it. Action is not punishable with lashes but is there not the case of one who exchanges an unconsecrated animal for a consecrated animal which involves no action and yet it is punishable with lashes for we have learned not that one is permitted to exchange but that if one did so the substitute is sacred and he receives 40 lashes Rab can answer you this our mission is the opinion of our Judah who holds a negative command the transgression of which involves no action is punishable with lashes but how can you explain the mission in accordance with the view of our Judah surely have we not explained the first clause of the mission as not being in accordance with the view of our Judah for the mission states all persons can exchange and it was asked what does Hakal all include and the answer was that it includes the case of an error not in accordance with our Judah this tana of the mission agrees with our Judah on one point namely that a negative command the transgression of which involves no action is punishable with lashes but differs from him in another point for whereas our Judah holds that an heir cannot lay hands on the head of his father's sacrifice and that an heir cannot effect an exchange our Tana holds that an heir can lay hands on the head of his father's sacrifice and can effect an exchange already son of our Abin reported in the name of our Amram our Isaac and our Yohanan our Judah reported in the name of our Jose the Galilean in respect of every negative command laid down in the Torah if one actually does something in transgressing it he is punishable with lashes but if he does not actually do anything in transgressing it he is not punishable except in the cases of one who takes an oath exchanges an unconsecrated animal for a consecrated animal and curses his fellow with the name in which cases though he committed no action he is punished with lashes the rabbi said in the name of our Jose son of our Hanan in the case also of one who Name Terima before Bikurim once do we derive that one who takes an oath is punishable with lashes or Yohanan reported in the name of our Meir scripture says for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain thus intimating that the heavenly tribunal Talmud, Mosti Murabi will not hold him guiltless but the earthly tribunal punish him with lashes and hold him guiltless said our Papa Juebe why not say that the meaning of the text is that the earthly tribunal will not punish him at all he replied to him if this be the case let scripture state he shall not hold him guiltless and say no more what is the need for the word the Lord in order to intimate it is the heavenly tribunal which will not hold him guiltless but the earthly tribunal punish him with lashes and hold him guiltless we find therefore biblical authority for the case of an oath once do we derive that one is punishable with lashes for a false oath or Yohanan himself said that Expression in vain is stated twice if it has no bearing on the subject of a vain oath apply it to the case of a false oath as intimating that one is punishable with lashes to this our Abu Adamard how is a false oath to be understood shall we say if he said I will not eat and he did eat but in that case he performed action on the other hand where he said I will eat and he did not eat would he be punishable with lashes in such a case has it not been stated if he says I swear that I will eat this loaf today and the day passed and he did not eat both our Yohanan and our Simeon be like hold that he is not punishable with lashes our Yohanan says he is not punishable with lashes because it is a negative command the transgression of which involves no action and for breaking a prohibitory law which does not involve an action one is not punishable with lashes whereas our Simeon be says he is not punishable with lashes because he can be given only a doubtful warning and a Doubtful warning cannot render one punishable with lashes rather said our Abuala the case of a false oath then be if he says I have eaten or I have not eaten and why is the case if he says I swear I have eaten or I swear I have not eaten different said Rabbi the Torah plainly implies a false oath similar to a vain oath just as a vain oath refers to the past so a false oath also refers to the past our Jeremiah cited the following in objection to our Abuala if he says I swear that I will not eat this loaf I swear I will not eat it I swear I will not eat it and he ate it he is punishable only on one count and this is the oath of utterance for which one is liable to lashes if it is willfully broken and to a sliding scale sacrifice if in error now what case does the expression this is excluded is it not surely the case of one who says I swear I have eaten or I swear I have not eaten that he is not lashed no this is what it means this is an example of an oath of utterance for which if broken in error one brings a sacrifice but where he says I swear I have eaten or I have not eaten he does not bring a sacrifice and whose opinion is this that of our Ishmael who says one is liable to bring a sacrifice for an oath of utterance only when the oath relates to the future but you may say that he is punishable with lashes read then the second clause this is a vain oath for which one is punishable with lashes if it is willfully broken and if in error one is exempt now what case does the word this is excluded is it not surely the case of one who says elsewhere I have eaten or I swear I have not eaten so that he is not punishable with lashes no it means this this is a case of a vain oath where if it is broken in error one is exempted from bringing a sacrifice but where one says I swear I have eaten or I swear I have not eaten he brings a sacrifice and whose opinion is this that of our Akiva who says one brings a sacrifice for an oath of utterance even if it relates to the past but have you not explained that the first clause is the opinion of our Ishmael rather we must say since the second clause is the opinion of our Akiva therefore the first clause will also be the opinion of our Akiva and the first clause therefore will not exclude the case of one who says I have eaten or I have not eaten but will exclude the case of one who says I shall eat or I shall not eat and what is the difference where it speaks of the future it excludes something relating to the future but where it speaks of the future would it exclude something relating to the past and one who exchanges said our Yohanan to the Tana do not read and one who exchanges because his very words constitute an action and he who curses his fellow with the name whence is this proof our Eliezer reported in the name of our Ashai the verse says if thou wilt not observe to do etc and it says then the Lord will make thy plagues wonderful now I do not know in what this wonder consists but when scripture Says that the judge caused him to lie down to be beaten. This shows that the wonderful punishment means punishment with lashes. But why not say that it refers even to a true oath? It is explicitly stated, and shall the oath of the Lord be between them? But why not say that this is only with the object of appeasing his neighbor? But that in reality he is punished with lashes. You cannot say this, for is it not written? And shall swear by his name? But we need this text in order to derive it. Ruling of Argidal for Argidal said, once do we derive that one may swear to observe the commandments? For it says, I have sworn and I will perform it that I will keep thy righteous judgments. Is there not, however, another text? And to him shalt thou cling and swear by his name? Then what does the text, if thou wilt not observe to do, come to teach us that one who curses his fellow with the name is punishable with lashes? But why not say that the text refers to one who pronounces the Lord's name? For no purpose is then one who curses his fellow with the name less culpable than one who pronounces the Lord's name for no purpose our question is really this why not say that for one who pronounces the Lord's name for no purpose the punishment of lashes will suffice but if one curses his fellow with the name since he commits two forbidden things first in pronouncing the Lord's name for no purpose and then in vexing his fellow therefore punishment with lashes should not be sufficient. Talmud, Masti Mura you cannot say this since it is written thou shalt not curse the deaf or if you prefer another solution I may say there is no difficulty if the text above refers to one who curses his fellow with the name its warning in that case would be derived from here since it is written thou shalt not curse the deaf but if you say that it refers to one who utters the Lord's name for no purpose whence is its warning derived but why not but does not scripture say thou shalt. Fear the Lord thy God and serve him. The text is only a positive admonition. The rabbi said in the name of our Jose son of Arhanan, in the case also of one who names Terima before Bikurim, what is the reason of our Jose son of Arhanan? The verse says, Thou shalt not delay to offer of the fullness of thy harvest and of the outflow of thy presses. The fullness of thy harvest. This refers to the Bikurim, the outflow of thy presses. This refers to Terima, and scripture says, Thou shalt not delay. It was stated if one named Terima before Bikurim, there is a difference of opinion between our Eliezer and our Jose son of Arhanan. One says he is punishable with lashes, while the other says he is not punishable with lashes. You may conclude that it is our Jose son of Arhanan
The name of Arhose, son of Arhan, and also one who names Teramah before Bikurim, and why is it that one who exchanges his punishable with lashes assumedly because with his very words he performs an action, and the case of one who names Teramah before Bikurim should also be punishable with lashes since with his words he performed an action said Arabin, it is different, therefore the prohibition of not delaying the priestly dues is a negative command that is remediable by a positive command. Since it is written out of all your gifts, ye shall offer every eve offering. Ardimi was once sitting and repeating this tradition. Abay asked him, and is it true that every negative command which is remediable by a positive command is not punishable with lashes? Is there not the case of one who exchanges an unconsecrated animal for a consecrated animal which is a negative command remediable by a positive command and is yet punishable with lashes? For we have learned in our mission not that one is permitted to exchange, but that if one did so, the substitute is sacred and he receives forty lashes. The case of one who exchanges is different. For here are two negative commands and one positive command, and one positive command cannot displace two negative commands. But is there not the case of one who violates a woman for which act there is one negative command and one positive command, and yet the positive command does not displace the negative command? For it has been taught if one. Violates a maiden and then divorces her after marriage. If he is an Israelite, he takes her back and is not punished with lashes. But if he is a priest, he is punished with lashes and he does not take her back. You mentioned the case of priests. Their case is different for the divine law invests them with added sanctity. This is a matter of dispute between Tanaim and Yeshal. Let nothing remain of it until the morning, and that which remains of it until morning, Yeshal burn with fire. Scripture here has come to state a positive command following a negative command in order to inform us that one is not punishable with lashes on account thereof. So our Judah, our Jacob says this comes not under this head, but the reason is because it is a negative command. The transgression of which involves no action and the transgression of a negative command in which no action is involved is not punishable with lashes. This implies does it not that our Judah holds that it is punishable with lashes and According to our Jacob, what does the text and that which remains of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire come to teach it is required for what we have learned the bones attendants and that which remains of the paschal lamb are burnt on the sixteenth of Nisan if the sixteenth of Nisan fell on the Sabbath they are burnt on the seventeenth because the burning of sacred things does not supersede either the Sabbath or festivals and Hezekiah said and so taught Atana of the school of Hezekiah what is the reason scripture says that which remains of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire the text came to give a second morning for its burning said of any act which the divine law forbids if it has been done it has legal effect for if you were to think that the act has no legal effect why then is one punishable on account thereof with lashes Rabbah however said the act has no legal effect at all and the reason why one is punishable with lashes on account thereof is because one has transgressed the command of the divine law Talmud, Masti Mira, an objection was raised if one violates a maiden and then divorces her after marriage. If he is an Israelite, he must take her back and is not punished with lashes. Now, if you say that since one has transgressed the command of the divine law, one is punished with lashes, then here he too should be punished with lashes. This refutes Rabba Rabba can answer you. The case is different, therefore, Scripture says all his days. Intimating that all his days, if he divorces her, he is required to take her back. And what does Abbe say to this? If the divine law had not said all his days, I might have thought that there exists a mere prohibition, but that if he wishes, he can take her back, and if he wishes, he need not the text all his days. Therefore, teaches us that this is not so. Another version they raised an objection if one violates a woman and marries her and then divorces her, if he is an Israelite, he takes her. Back and is not punishable with lashes, but if he is a priest, he is punishable with lashes, and he does not take her back at all events. At the Beritha says, if he is an Israelite, he takes her back, and he is punishable with lashes. This refutes Abay. The case is different there, since the divine law says all his days, intimating that all his days, if he divorces her, he is required to remarry her. And what does Rabbah say to this? Rabbah can answer you if the divine law had not said all his days. I might have thought that he would be punishable with lashes, and that he must remarry her. For the law of one who violates a woman is an unqualified negative command, since it is written he may not put her away all his days. For this reason, Scripture says all his days to make the law of one who violates a woman a negative command remediable by a positive command, for which there is no punishment of lashes. But is there not the case of one who separates terima from bad grain for good grain? Concerning which the divine law says of all the best thereof he must bring as terima the best thereof but not from the inferior and yet we have learned we may not separate terima from the bad grain for the good but if one did so it is counted as terima consequently we see that a forbidden act has a legal effect shall we say that this refutes Rabba Rabba can answer you the case is different for it will be as Arale for Arale said once do we deduce that if one separated terima from bad grain for good grain it is counted as terima it says and ye shall bear no sin by reason of it when ye have heaped from it the best of it now if the terima is not holy wherefore should he bear sin hence we infer that if one separates terima from bad grain for good grain it is counted as terima and Abay, if the divine law had not said and ye shall bear no sin I might have thought what the divine law means is perform him as well in the best way but if one did not do so he is not Call the sinner the text therefore informs us that this is not so but is there not the case of one who separates from one species to serve as terima for another species concerning which the divine law says all the best of the oil and all the best of the wine intimating that he must give the best as terima for the one species and the best as terima for the other and we have learned one must not separate terima from one species for another species and if one did so it is not counted as terima consequently we see that a forbidden act has no legal effect shall we say that this refutes Abay Abay can answer you the case is different there since scripture says the first part of them thus implying the first of the species and the first of that species and Ali said likewise the text says the first part of them intimating the first of the species and the first of that species and Rabbah if the divine law had not stated the first part of them I might have Thought that only in the case of wine and oil with reference to which the text says the best the best we may not set aside one species for the other but in the case of wine and corn or corn and corn where the best is mentioned only once we may separate one species for the other the divine law therefore says the first part of them to teach that one must give the best of one species and the best of the other another version but in the case of wine and corn in connection with which the best is mentioned only once I might think that one may separate from this wine for that corn scripture therefore says the first part of them but is there not the case of devoted things with reference to which scripture says notwithstanding no devoted thing that a man may devote unto the Lord of all that he hath whether of man or of beast or of the field of his possession shall be sold or redeemed and we have learned things devoted to priests are not subject to redemption but must be given to the Priest, consequently, we see that a forbidden act has no legal effect. Shall we say that this refutes Abay? Abay will answer you. The case is different. Therefore, the divine law says every devoted thing most holy unto the Lord. It is intimating that it shall remain in its status. Talmud, Masti Murabi. But according to Rabbah, the text it is comes to exclude the case of a firstling, for it has been taught with reference to a firstling. It says, Thou shalt not redeem, implying that it may be sold in connection with the tithing animal. It says, It shall not be redeemed and may neither be sold alive nor dead, neither unblemished nor blemished. But is there not the case of Hemura concerning which the divine law says he shall not alter it nor change it? And yet we learned not that one is permitted to exchange, but that if one did so, the substitute is sacred and he receives forty lashes. Consequently, we see that a forbidden act has a legal effect. This refutes Rabbah. Rabbah can answer you. The case there. Is different for scripture says that it and the exchange thereof shall be holy, implying that if the exchanged animal must retain its sacred character and obey if the divine law had not said that it and the exchange thereof shall be holy, I might have thought that the consecrated animal ceases to be holy, and this one the exchanged animal enters into holiness. Scripture therefore informs us that this is not so, but is there not the case of the firstling of which the divine law says, but the firstling of a cow or the firstling of a sheep or the firstling of a goat thou shalt not redeem, and we have learned sacrifices rendered unfit for the altar have redemption themselves and their exchanges, except in the case of a firstling or a tithing animal. Consequently, we see that a forbidden act has no legal effect. This refutes Abay Abay will answer you the case is different, therefore scripture says holy they are intimating that they remain in their sacred status and what? Will Rabbah do with the word they
There since we draw an analogy between the term passing used in connection with an animal tithe and the term passing used in connection with the first ling but is there not the case of one who names Terima before Bikurim concerning which the Divine Law says thou shalt not delay to offer of the fullness of thy harvest and of the outflow of thy press and we have learned if one names Terima before Bikurim although he is guilty of transgressing a negative command his action is valid this refutes. Rabba Rabba will answer you the case is different there since scripture says out of all your gifts ye shall offer every heave offering and Abay he needs the words out of all your gifts for answering the question which our Papa put to Abay if this be the case then even if he the Levite anticipated the priest when the grain was in the pile he should be exempt from the obligation of Terima and Abay answered him to meet your query scripture says out of all your gifts ye shall offer. Every heave offering but why do you see fit to include the case of when the grain was in the pile and to exclude the case of grain in the ear I include the case of grain in the pile because it comes under the title of corn whereas I exclude the case of grain in the ear because it does not come under the title of corn but is there not the case of a widow married by a high priest concerning which the divine law says a widow or a divorced woman these shall he not take and we have learned. Wherever betrothal is valid and yet involves a transgression the child has the legal status of the party which causes the transgression the case is different there since scripture says neither shall he profane a seed among his people and have a let scripture then say lo yahel lo yahel one profanation refers to with the child and the other to the woman herself but is there not the case of one who dedicates blemished animals for the altar concerning which the divine law says but Whatsoever hath a blemish that shall ye not offer, and it has been taught if one dedicates blemished animals for the altar, although he infringes a negative command, the act is valid. This refutes Rabba Rabba can answer you. The case is different there, since scripture says, For it shall not be acceptable for you, intimating that it is not acceptable, but that its consecration is legal, and Abay, if scripture had not stated, For it shall not be acceptable for you, I might have thought the case should be similar to that of one who transgresses a religious command, but that if the animal is fit even to offer up the text, therefore informs us that it is not so. But is there not the case of one who dedicates unblemished animals for temple repairs concerning which the divine law says, Talmud, Mastim, Ure, anything too long or too short that mayest thou offer for a free will offering that is for dedications for temple repairs, and we have learned if one consecrates unblemished animals for Temple repairs although he infringes a negative command the act is valid this refutes Rabba Rabba can answer you from the same verse from which you include the case of blemished animals dedicated for the altar you include the case of unblemished animals dedicated for temple repairs but is there not the case of one who steals concerning which the divine law says thou shalt not steal and we have learned if one steals wood and makes it into vessels or wool and makes it into garments he pays the value of the object as it was at the time of the theft this refutes Rabba Rabba can answer you the case is different there since scripture says that he shall restore that which he took by robbery intimating that the restoration is to be according to what he had robbed and obey the text that which he took by robbery is required in order to teach that he adds a fifth for his own robbery but not for that of his father but is there not the case of one who takes the pledge concerning which the Divine law says thou shalt not go into his house to fetch his pledge and we have learned he the creditor returns the pillow at night and the plow in the day this refutes Rabba Rabba can answer you the case is different therefore scripture says thou shalt surely restore the pledge and Abay if the divine law had not stated thou shalt surely restore the pledge I might have thought that he has only broken a prohibition and if he wishes he can restore the pledge and if he wishes he need not. The text therefore informs us that it is not so but is there not the case of P.E.I. concerning which the divine law says thou shalt not wholly reap the corner of thy field and we have learned the proper performance of the command of P.E.I. is to separate from the standing corn if he did not separate from the standing corn he separates from the sheaves if he did not separate from the sheaves he separates from the pile of grain before he evens it if he has evened it he tithes it and then gives. P. Ya to him the poor man in the name of our Ishmael it was said he also separates from the dough this refutes Abay Abay can answer you the case is different there since scripture says thou shalt leave and again thou shalt leave as redundant and Rabba he can answer you there is another case of leaving similar to this and what is it it is the case of one who renounces ownership of his vineyard for it was taught if one renounces ownership of his vineyard and wakes in the morning and harvests it he is bound to give parrot the defective great cluster the forgotten sheep and P. Ya but he is exempt from tithe said Araha the son of Rabba to our Ashi and now that you have given all these various answers wherein do Abay and Rabba really differ they differ in the case of stipulated usury and will be on the lines of our Eliezer's statement for our Eliezer said stipulated usury can be reclaimed through the judge's Talmud Mastim Yerubi whereas the dust of usury cannot be reclaimed through the Judges are Yohanan however says even stipulated usury is not reclaimed through the judges thereupon he Araha said to him but do they differ merely in opinion do they not differ in the interpretation of scriptural texts for our Isaac said what is the reason of our Yohanan scripture says he hath given forth upon usury and hath taken increase shall he then live he shall not live thus intimating that the taking of usury is a matter that affects life but is not subject to restoration Araha be at says from your scripture says but fear thy God intimating that the taking of usury is a matter of fearing God but is not subject to restoration Rabba says from your scripture says he hath done all these abominations he shall surely die his blood shall be upon him now lo if he begot a son that is a robber a shedder of blood lenders on interest are compared to shedders of blood just as shedders of blood cannot make restoration of the lives lost so lenders on interest are not required to make Restoration of interest and our nomin B. Isaac said what is the reason of our Eliezer scripture says that thy brother may live with thee thus intimating that he must return the interest so that he the borrower may live with you but then wherein do Abay and Rabba really differ on the question whether a change enables one to obtain ownership another version the difference will be in the various answers given above still another version the difference will be in the matter of stipulated. Usury according to Abay he the debtor does not return the interest whereas according to Rabba he is required to return the interest but does not Abay also hold that we reclaim stipulated usury through the judges for Abay said if one claims four zoos from his fellow as interest and the latter gave the lender in his shop for it a garment to the value of five zoos we recover four zoos from him and the remaining zoos we say he gave as a gift Rabba says however we recover from him five zoos. What is the reason the whole sum came to him as interest rather than the difference of opinion between Abay and Rabba is in whether a change confers ownership or rabbis taught scripture says whatsoever hath a blemish that ye shall not offer now what does the text teach us if it means that ye shall not kill is this not stated below why then does the text state ye shall not offer it means ye shall not dedicate hence the sages said he who dedicates blemished animals for the altar is guilty. On all five counts for transgressing the prohibitory laws with reference to offering to dedicating killing sprinkling and burning holy or partly they the sages said in the name of our Jose he is guilty also on account of the prohibition of the receiving of the blood the master said if it means ye shall not kill is not this mentioned below where is this stated it has been taught blind or broken or maimed ye shall not offer these unto the Lord what does scripture teach us here if it means. Not to dedicate this is already stated above then what does scripture mean by ye shall not offer that ye shall not kill the text nor make an offering by fire of them refers to the burning of the sacrifices on the altar from this I could only prove the burning of the whole sacrifice as being prohibited whence however will you deduce that the same applies to a part of a sacrifice because the text states of them whence will you deduce the prohibited law for the sprinkling of the blood. A blemished animals the text states upon the altar the succeeding words unto the Lord include the case of a scapegoat but do the words unto the Lord come to include something additional has it not been taught now if you expound the word Corban offering am I to understand it to include the case of animals dedicated for temple repairs which are described as Corban as for instance when it says we have therefore brought the Lord's Corban the text however states and hath not brought it. Unto the door of the tent of the meeting we therefore argue as follows in respect of whatever is fit for the door of the tent of the meeting one may become liable on account of the prohibition of slaughtering consecrated animals outside the temple court but in respect of whatever is not fit for the door of the tent of the meeting one cannot become liable on account of the prohibition of slaughtering consecrated animals outside the temple court shall I therefore exclude these but
Rabba says the text is not required save for the case where e.g. the scapegoat became blemished on that day and he redeemed it for another animal Talmud. Mas Timura you might argue that we can well understand why at the outset we require both animals to be unblemished because we do not know which one will be designated for the Lord but here since the animal designated for the Lord is recognized there is no punishment of lashes the text unto the Lord mentioned above therefore informs us that it is not so the master said it is reported in the name of our Jose son of Arjuda there is also the case of the prohibitory law relating to the receiving of the blood what is the reason of our Jose son of Arjuda scripture says that which hath its stones bruised or crushed or torn or cut etc ye shall not offer unto the Lord this refers to the receiving of the blood mentioned by our Jose son of Arjuda and according to the first tano what need is there for this text ye shall not Offer it is necessary for the case of the sprinkling of the blood of a blemished animal, but do we not deduce this from the text upon the altar? This is simply scripture's manner of speaking, but may it not also be according to our Jose son of Arjuda's scripture's manner of speaking? Yes, it is so. Then whence does he deduce the prohibition in respect of receiving the blood? He derives this ruling from the following: neither from the hand of a foreigner shall ye offer this refers to the receiving of the blood mentioned by our Jose son of Arjuda. And what does the first tana do with this text? Neither shall ye offer. He needs it for this. It may occur to you to think that since the Noahides were only commanded concerning the loss of limbs, it is therefore immaterial whether the sacrifice is for their altar or ours. The text therefore informs us that this is not so. Another version: our Jose son of Arjuda says there is also the prohibition relating to the receiving of the blood. What is it? Reason since scripture says that which hath its stones bruised or crushed etc. ye shall not offer unto the Lord this refers to the receiving of the blood and the prohibition of sprinkling is derived from the text upon the altar and according to the rabbis why not also derive the prohibition of sprinkling from the text upon the altar in fact they do then what does the text ye shall not offer stated in connection with the text bruised or crushed come to teach it is required to teach us the case of a private bama and according to our Jose son of Arjuda do we not require the text to teach us the case of a private bama yes it is so then whence does he derive the prohibition of offering with reference to the receiving of the blood he derives it from the text neither from the hand of a foreigner shall ye offer this meaning the receiving of the blood and the rabbis there is need for the text you might think that since the Noahides are only commanded concerning the loss of a limb for their own Bama we too may therefore accept from them a permanently blemished animal the text of any of these therefore informs us that we do not accept to this rush lakish demur perhaps this is stated only in connection with the case of an unblemished animal which became blemished in which case there is a transgression but if it is an originally blemished animal it is then a mere palm tree thereupon our high Joseph said to him scripture says too long or too short in the section and these are originally blemished animals he rush lakish said perhaps we have learned this only with reference to substitutes for we have learned there is a restriction in the law regarding substitutes which does not apply to original sacrifices in that holiness can attach a substitute to an animal permanently blemished are you had and replied to him have you not heard what our said at the college vote was taken and it was decided he who dedicates a blemished animal for the altar is guilty on Five counts now if this passage deals with substitutes then there are six for there is also the prohibition of exchanging what then do you maintain that he deals with the case of an animal originally blemished then why should there be the punishment of lashes since it is merely a palm tree he replied there is nothing irreverential about a palm tree as it is a kind of wood but in dedicating an originally blemished animal there is something irreverential as regards consecration since he ignores unblemished animals and dedicates blemished ones and therefore he is guilty another version he or high said to him rush lakish even so the act is irreverential for the dedication of a palm tree as there is nothing in its class fit for the altar there is no punishment of lashes but the case is otherwise with reference to a blemished animal since there exists in the class of animals those fit for the altar and he is therefore punishable with lashes said Robin, now that you say that the reason why one who dedicates a blemished animal incurs the punishment of lashes is because the act is irreverential and even if one dedicates a blemished animal for the value of its drink offerings one should incur the punishment of lashes robbers is a point at issue among Tanim Talmud. Mastim Yerubi scripture says that mayest thou offer for a freewill offering this refers to dedications for temple repairs now I have here mentioned only the case of a freewill offering. Whence do we derive that the same applies to a vow scripture says and for a vow one might think that the blemished animals vowed for offering are fit even for the altar the text however states and for a vow it shall not be accepted thus referring to dedications for the altar I here mentioned only the case of a freewill offering whence can we derive that it is the same with reference to a vow the text states a freewill offering rabbi said scripture says it shall not be accepted the text thus. Speaks of accepting its body for sacrifice on the altar, but is not this opinion precisely that of the first tana? Must we not say that they differ in this? The first tana holds that even if he dedicates the blemished animal for the value of drink offerings, he also incurs the punishment of lashes. Whereas Rabbi says the punishment only applies to the acceptance of the body, but not if the dedication is for the value of a drink offering. It stands proved. But why then is the word that inserted it is needed to intimate what has been taught? Scripture says that mayest thou offer for a free will offering, thus intimating that you may offer as a free will offering for temple repairs, but you may not offer unblemished animals as a free will offering for temple repairs. Hence the Rabbi say he who dedicates unblemished animals for temple repairs is guilty of transgressing a positive command. And whence do we derive that one is guilty of transgressing a negative command? Because it says and it. Lord spake unto Moses saying thus teaching us that the whole section is regarded as having the force of a prohibitory law this is the teaching of our Judah said Rabbi Jabbar Kippur how do you understand this he replied to him because of the word saying which indicates that a negative command has been said in connection with these statements the school of Rabbi says the word saying means tell the children of Israel a negative command it is stated if one burns on the altar the limbs of blemished animals Rabbi says he transgresses the prohibitory laws of burning a hole and burning a part Abbe says there is no punishment of lashes for a comprehensive prohibition they raised an objection he who dedicates blemished animals for the altar is guilty on five counts this refutes Abbe said Arkahana it refers to different individuals but if it the Baritha refers to different individuals why then does the Baritha say he incurs etc is not the incur required then obviously the Baritha refers to one individual shall we say that this refutes Abay Abay can answer you exclude from the bury the prohibition for burning part of the blemished animal on the altar and include the prohibition for receiving the blood of the blemished animal you say the receiving of the blood this prohibition is maintained only by our Jose son of Arjuda but not by the rabbis this is a difficulty another version since the latter part of the bury is the opinion of our Jose son of Ar. Judah the first part will be the opinion of the rabbis shall we say this refutes Abay this is a final refutation Mishnah priests have power to exchange an animal belonging to themselves and Israelites also have power to exchange an animal belonging to themselves priests have not the power to exchange a sin offering a guilt offering or a firstling said are you had what is the reason why priests have not the power to exchange a firstling or Akiva said to him a sin offering and a guilt Offering our priestly gifts and a firstling is also a priestly gift, just as in the case of a sin offering and guilt offering, priests have no power to exchange them. So in the case of a firstling, priests have no power to exchange it. Said Aryohan and Binuri, it is right that priests should have no power to exchange a sin offering and a guilt offering because they have no claim on these offerings while these are alive. Will you, however, say that the same applies to a firstling on which the priests have a claim when it is alive? Our Akiva thereupon replied to him, Has not scripture already said that it and the exchange thereof shall be holy? Now, where does the holiness arise in the house of the owner? Similarly, exchange is not effected except in the house of the owner's Gemara. We have learned elsewhere an unblemished firstling may be sold alive, but a blemished firstling, whether alive or slaughtered, and the priest may also betroth the woman with it. Said Arnaman in the name of Rabbi. Abu this was taught only for nowadays since a priest has a claim upon it but in temple time since an unblemished firstling is destined to be offered up we may not sell it alive unblemished robber raised an objection to our nom an unblemished firstling may be sold alive it says alive implying but not slaughtered now to what
dealing with an unblemished firstling and it says but it may be sold but is this an argument the first part of the text refers to a blemished animal and the latter part of the text refers to an unblemished firstling our measure she raised an objection if the child of a priestess became mixed up with the child of her slave when the children grow up they free one another both may eat terima they take their share simultaneously at the threshing floor their firstling is left to pasture until blemished and it is eaten blemished by their owners now with what case are we here dealing shall i say that we are dealing with the firstling of nowadays for then what is the difference between a firstling belonging to ourselves and a firstling belonging to them since a firstling belonging to ourselves also requires a blemish to be eaten then you must admit that we are dealing with a firstling in temple times now if you say that the priest has a claim on a firstling alive there will be no Difficulty, but if you say that he has no claim on a firstling alive, then let the temple treasurer come and take it. One can still say that we are dealing with a firstling of nowadays, and as regards the difficulty you raise as to why a firstling belonging to ourselves is different from a firstling belonging to them, the answer is we give ours to the priest in its blemished condition, but with a firstling belonging to them, since there is an element of priest, the priests are excluded from claiming this firstling. Another version now, if we are dealing with a firstling of nowadays, why mention firstlings belonging to persons of uncertain priesthood, even firstlings belonging to ourselves also are left to pasture until blemished, then obviously we are dealing with a firstling of temple times now. If we are referring to a blemished firstling, why do we say let them be left to pasture until blemished? Are they not already blemished? Then obviously we are dealing with unblemished. Firstlings and only these may not sell but persons who are certainly priests may sell it may still be that we are dealing with firstlings of nowadays what is your difficulty that even firstlings belonging to ourselves should also be left to pasture the answer is we cannot disregard the priest for there exists no uncertainty of the priesthood but these persons of uncertain priesthood can put off the priest each one saying to the priest I am a priest I am a priest an objection was raised. Our Simeon said scripture says and the cattle thereof this excludes a firstling animal and an animal tithe in it the city the spoil of it this excludes the money of the second tithe now with what case are we dealing shall I say that we are dealing with nowadays for is the law of an apostate city enforced nowadays have we not learned we do not practice the law of an apostate city except where there is in existence a beth din of 71 then obviously we are dealing with temple times and in what condition was the firstling if it was blemished is this not the same as the text the cattle thereof then obviously we are dealing with an unblemished firstling now there will be no difficulty if you say that the priest has a claim on the firstling alive but if you say the priest has no claim on the firstling alive what need is there for the text the cattle thereof why not derive this from the text the spoil of it from which we can deduce but not the spoil of heaven one can still maintain that we are dealing with a blemished animal and as regards the difficulty you raise that this is a case covered by the text the cattle thereof the answer is this implies whatever is eaten in the manner of the cattle thereof excluding the cases of the firstling and animals tithe for they are not covered by the words the cattle thereof for we have learned in the mission all dedications rendered unfit for sacrifice may be sold in the market and by the pound with the exception of a Firstling and an animal tithe for their benefit belongs to the owners an objection was raised scripture says and committed a trespass against the Lord this includes sacrifices of minor grades of holiness which are considered the money of the owners these are the words of our Jose the Galilean Ben Aze says this text comes to include peace offerings Abba Jose the son of Dosai says our Jose the Galilean only refers to a firstling now what period are we dealing with shall I say that of nowadays surely the case of the firstling referred to by Abba Jose is compared with peace offerings then obviously we are dealing with temple times now what are the circumstances shall I say that we are dealing with the case of a blemished firstling surely the case of the firstling referred to by Abba Jose is compared with peace offerings then you must say that you are dealing with the case of an unblemished firstling deduce therefore from here that a priest has a claim on a firstling alive tongue good Mosti Mirabi said Rabbanu one may still say that we are dealing with an unblemished firstling and we are alluding here to a firstling outside the Holy Land and the Tana of this Berita is our Simeon who says if unblemished firstlings came from outside Palestine they may be offered up an objection was raised our Yohan and Binuri said to him granted that one has no power to exchange a sin offering and a guilt offering since priests have no claim on them while the animals are alive can we say that the same applies to a firstling where the priest has a claim on it while it is alive now what case is here referred to shall I say it is the case of a blemished animal but the Mishnah compares a firstling with a sin offering and a guilt offering then you must say that the case is that of an unblemished animal and it states they have a claim on the firstling alive said Rabbanu here too the case is of a firstling outside Palestine and the Tana of this Mishnah is our Simeon who says if they came unblemished, they are offered up, shall we say that Tanaim differ on that point, for it was taught with the firstling in the house of the owners there can be effected an exchange, but there can be no exchange effected when in the house of a priest. Our Simeon B. Eliezer says since it comes into the house of a priest, there can be no exchange effected, but is not this the identical opinion of the first Tana? Then must you not say that the first Tana means this in the house of a priest? The priest alone can effect the exchange, but not the owner, and consequently we see that the priest has a claim on the firstling. No, the difference of opinion here is the same as the difference of opinion between our Yohan and Binuri and our Akiva. The first Tana will hold the view of our Yohan and Binuri, whereas our Simeon will hold the view of our Akiva. Said our they have taught this only with regard to a case of a priest selling to a priest, but a priest is forbidden to sell to an Israelite. What is it? Reason lest an Israelite should go and cast a blemish on it the firstling and bring it to a sage and say a priest gave me this firstling with its blemish but can a sage permit it in such circumstances has not rap said one may not sell a firstling belonging to an Israelite unless the priest be present with him said Arhuna the son of Arjashu the reason why it is forbidden for a priest to sell to an Israelite is because this appears similar to the case of a priest who assists in the threshing floor Marzitra once visited Arashi they said to him let the master partake of something they set meat before him they said to him let the master eat it because it is healthy for it comes from a firstling he Marzitra asked them how did you get this they answered him a certain priest sold it to us with its blemish he said to them do you not hold with what Arhuna the son of Arjashu said because this appears similar to the case of a priest who assists in the threshing floor they Reply to him, we do not hold this opinion since we have indeed bought the firstling. He said to them, and do you not hold what we have learned? How long is an Israelite required to look after a firstling in the case of small cattle, thirty days, and in the case of large cattle, fifty days? If the priest said to the Israelite, give it to me within this period, the Israelite must not give it to him. And Arshis hate said, now what is the reason? Because it appears similar to the case of a priest who assists in the threshing floor. They replied to him, there the thing is obvious. Whereas here we do indeed buy it. Another version. They replied to him, Marzitra, there he does not give any money, but your money was paid. Perhaps you will still say that the priest lowers the price to him, thinking to himself, when the Israelite has another firstling, he will give it to me. No, for he will rather reflect Talmud, Masti Mira, that a young pumpkin now is better than a full-grown pumpkin tomorrow. Mission one. Can affect an exchange with small cattle for oxen and with oxen for small cattle with sheep for goats and with goats for sheep with male animals for female animals and with female animals for male animals with unblemished animals for blemished animals and with blemished animals for unblemished animals since scripture says he shall not alter it nor change it a good for a bad or a bad for a good what kind is meant by good for a bad blemished animals whose dedication was prior to their blemish tomorrow whence is this proof our rabbis have taught scripture says beast for beast hence we infer that one can affect an exchange with small cattle for oxen and with oxen for small cattle with sheep for goats and with goats for sheep with male animals for female animals and with female animals for male animals with blemished animals for unblemished animals and with unblemished animals for blemished animals one might think that this is so even if they had a Permanent blemish prior to their dedication the text therefore states he shall not alter it nor change it a good for a bad or a bad for a good what kind is meant by a good for a bad blemished animals whose dedication was prior to their blemish but not where the blemish was prior to their dedication how is this implied in the scriptural text said of a let scripture
Lashes if one exchanges a good for a good which are alike in holiness and Rabba an offense established by inference from minor to major is not punishable and Abbe he can answer you thus this is no conclusion from minor to major but is merely an intimation of a thing for is the case of a good and unblemished consecrated animal worse than the case of a bad blemished animal our rabbis taught he shall not alter it for Holland belonging to others nor change it for Holland belonging to himself but let it write simply he shall not alter it and there will then be no need for the expression nor change it if it had written so I might have said that where the intention is for the original animal to lose its holiness and the substituted one to acquire holiness there is a punishment of lashes but in the case of exchanging the consecrated animal for his own Holland where if he wishes he can consecrate both I might have thought there is no punishment of lashes scripture. Therefore informs us that it is not so as to the expression for Holland belonging to others how is this to be understood shall we say that it means his own consecrated animal and Holland belonging to another but can he consecrate Holland in such circumstances the divine law says when a man shall sanctify his house to be holy unto the Lord just as his house is his own possession so everything must be in his possession again if the case then is of a consecration belonging to another and his own Holland can one cause the substitution of a thing which is not his one can still maintain that the case is of a consecrated animal belonging to another person and his own Holland and when he g the owner of the consecrated animal says whoever wishes to exchange with this animal may come and do so mission one can effect an exchange with one Holland for two consecrated animals and with two Holland for one consecrated animal with one Holland for a hundred consecrated animals and with a Hundred Holland for one consecrated animal are simian however says no exchange can be effected except with one Holland for one consecrated animal for it says that it and the exchange thereof shall be holy thus teaching us that just as if the consecrated animal is only one so its substitute also must be only one Gemara whence is this proof our rabbis taught scripture says beast for beast hence we infer that one can effect an exchange with one Holland for two consecrated animals and with two Holland for one consecrated animal with one Holland for a hundred consecrated animals and with a hundred Holland for one consecrated animal are simian however says one cannot effect exchange except with one Holland for one consecrated animal since it says beast for beast implying but not beast for beast or beast for beast they said to him we find in the scriptures that beasts are also called behemoth since it says and also much cattle behemoth and what does our simian Say to this many animals are described as behemoth of much but not simply as behemoth but is Arsimian's reason because of the expression beast is not the reason of Arsimian because of the expression and his reasoning being just as it is only one so its substitute must be only one at first Arsimian said to them that his reason was based on the text and the exchange thereof when he saw however that the rabbis interpreted the text beast for beast he said to them I also can derive the reason for my ruling from the same source said Rush Lakish Arsimian agrees that one can effect an exchange repeatedly what is the reason for where has the holiness of the first dedicated animal gone but our Yohanan says just as one cannot effect an exchange with two Holland for one consecration so one cannot effect an exchange repeatedly with the same animal there is a teaching in agreement with our Yohanan there is a teaching in agreement with Rush Lakish there is a teaching in agreement with Aryohan and just as one cannot effect an exchange with one Holland for two consecrations so one cannot effect an exchange repeatedly there is a teaching in accordance with the opinion of Rush Lakish one might have thought that just as our Simeon holds that one cannot effect an exchange with two Holland for one consecrated animal so one cannot effect an exchange repeatedly the text therefore states that it and the exchange thereof implying even for a hundred animals of Holland are often asked. How is it according to the authority who says that one cannot effect an exchange repeatedly if he set aside a guilt offering with which to obtain atonement and made an exchange for a Talmud, Mas Timi Rubi and it became blemished and he redeemed it for another which became lost and he obtained atonement through another guilt offering and the lost animal was then found and it was automatically transformed into a burnt offering what is the ruling as regards making an exchange for it said? Abbe, what is our Abin's inquiry if it the inquiry is concerning two bodies and one kind of holiness why not put the question without stating that he obtains atonement if the inquiry is concerning two kinds of holiness and one body why not put the question without stating that the first animal became blemished and our Abin's question is really in the form of one inquiry arising out of another as follows and if you will adopt the opinion that there can be no exchange in a case of two bodies and one kind of holiness since an animal has already been once exchanged in that holiness what of two bodies and two kinds of holiness let it stand undecided another version our Abin inquired according to the opinion of our Yohanan who holds that one has no power to exchange repeatedly the same dedicated animal if he set aside a guilt offering with which to obtain atonement and exchanged it and after the first animal became blemished he redeemed it for another what is the ruling as Regards exchanging again the second guilt offering or if he obtained atonement through another guilt offering and the first guilt offering was transformed into a burnt offering what is the ruling as regards changing it again said Abbe what is our Abin's main inquiry if as regards the exchange of another kind of holiness but in the same body then there is no need to mention that he redeemed it for another if as regards the exchange of another body in the same kind of holiness then there is no need to mention the atonement through another guilt offering and our Abin's question is really one inquiry arising out of another if the guilt offering became blemished and he exchanged it and redeemed it for another what is the ruling as regards exchanging it again do we say that there is no further exchange only with regard to the first guilt offering but with a separate body animal though it remains in the same kind of holiness of a guilt offering there can again be an Exchange or perhaps all animals in the same kind of holiness cannot be exchanged again and if you will adopt the opinion that since this other body remains in the same holiness there can be no further exchange than if he obtained atonement through another guilt offering and the first guilt offering was transformed into a burnt offering what is the ruling as regards exchanging it again do we say that we hold that one cannot exchange again only with reference to the same body animal in the same kind of holiness but the same body possessing another kind of holiness can be changed again or perhaps although there is another kind of holiness since it is the same body there can be no exchange again let it remain undecided said our Joshua B. Levi one adds a fifth for the first dedication but not for the second dedication said our Papa what is the reason of our Joshua B. Levi scripture says and if he that sanctified it will redeem his house then he shall add the fifth part of the money the text Saying he that sanctified implying but not one who causes holiness to an animal through another dedicated animal are often inquired if one set aside a guilt offering to obtain atonement and after it became blemished he redeemed it for another animal added a fifth and obtained atonement through another guilt offering and the first guilt offering was transformed into a burnt offering what of adding a fifth to it said Abbe what is our Abin's main inquiry if the inquiry is as regards adding a fifth for the redemption of two bodies and one kind of holiness then why not make the inquiry without mentioning that he obtained atonement and if the inquiry is as regards two kinds of holiness and one body then why not formulate an inquiry without mentioning that the first animal became blemished and our Abin's inquiry is really one question arising out of another if you will adopt the opinion that there is no fifth added when redeeming in the case of two bodies and one kind of Holiness since a fifth has already been once added in that holiness what is the ruling as regards two bodies and two kinds of holiness let it stand undecided another version are often inquired if one set aside a guilt offering to obtain atonement through it and after it became blemished he redeemed it for another what is the ruling as regards adding a fifth or if he obtained atonement through another guilt offering and the first animal being found was transformed into a burnt offering what is the ruling as regards adding a fifth said Abbe which is the main inquiry of our if his inquiry relates to another kind of holiness but in the same body then what need is there to mention that the first guilt offering became blemished and he redeemed it for another if it relates to another body in the same holiness then what need is there to mention that he was atoned for through another guilt offering and our his inquiry is really one question arising out of another question as follows if it became blemished and he redeemed it for another what is the ruling as regards adding a fifth is it only in redeeming the first guilt offering that one does not add a fifth but in the case of another body although it remains in the same kind of holiness one adds a fifth in redeeming it if blemished Talmud, Masimura or perhaps all dedications of the same holiness do not require the addition of a fifth and if you will say that since this other
We find that a congregation or partners have power of effecting exchange when e.g. they charge an agent to dedicate and moreover are not reported who not informed me it has been taught scripture says and of his offering unto the Lord for his separation beside that his hand shall get now is the offering of a Nazi right according to his pecuniary means how then are we to explain this the words his offering unto the Lord for his separation refer to where he is able to set aside the prescribed offering. From his own means the words beside that his hand shall get refer to where others set aside the prescribed offering for what practical ruling shall I say with reference to atonement surely it is obvious that he obtains atonement with another sacrifice seeing that they give it to him as a gift then must you not say that it is with reference to making exchange and the very above means this just as when he set aside an offering from his own means only he alone has power of effecting. Exchange so if others set aside an offering on his behalf he alone can effect exchange deduce therefore from here that we go by the person for whom atonement is made no one can still maintain that the very above refers to atonement and as to your difficulty do not the others who set aside the offering give it to him as a present had the divine law not included this in the text beside that his hand shall get I might have thought that it is a divine decree that the Nazi right can obtain atonement only with an offering brought from his own means but not from that set apart by others although it is given to him as a gift the text beside that etc therefore informs us that it is not so what is the decision in the matter come and here for our abo reported in the name of our Johann and he who dedicates and wishes to redeem his dedication must add a fifth the exchange of one for whose atonement an animal is dedicated is sacred if one separates the priestly due from his own grain for the untithed grain of his neighbor the right of disposal belongs to him who separates what is the reason scripture says all the tithes of thine increase and has given it etc mission with limbs of Holland no exchange can be effected for dedicated embryos nor with embryos of Holland for dedicated limbs nor with embryos and limbs of Holland for whole dedicated animals nor with whole animals of Holland for them our Jose says with limbs of Holland exchange can be effected for whole dedicated animals but not with whole animals of Holland for them said our Jose is it not the case in respect of dedications that if one says this foot shall be a burnt offering the whole animal becomes a burnt offering similarly if one says this foot shall be instead of this whole dedicated animal the whole animal should become a substitute in its place Gamar it was stated Barpata says dedication has no effect on embryos whereas our Johanan says dedication has Effect on embryos and our Yohanan follows the opinion he expressed elsewhere for our Yohanan said if one dedicates a pregnant sin offering and it gave birth if he wishes he may obtain atonement through it the mother and if he wishes he may obtain atonement through its offspring and both statements of our Yohanan are necessary for if he had made only the first statement I might have said that here where he dedicated Talmud, Masti Mirabi be the embryo by itself a dedication has effect on it but there where he dedicated the mother at the embryo is included in the dedication of the mother and therefore it the embryo is not wholly on its own account and if he made only the second statement I might have said that there he dedicated it the mother and all connected with it the embryo but here where he dedicated it the embryo since it is not emerged outside it is not wholly both statements of our Yohanan are therefore necessary another version what does our Yohanan inform us that if one left over the embryo his act is valid and that an embryo is not considered as the thigh of its mother but what need is there for the two statements of our Yohanan both are necessary for if the statement had been made in connection with this case only I might have said that there where the mother herself is fit for dedication since holiness attached to it the mother it also attached to the embryo but in the other case I might have said that it was not so our Yohanan therefore informs us otherwise and if our Yohanan had stated the law only in this case I might have said that there the reason was because he expressly dedicated the embryo but here the case is otherwise both statements of our Yohanan are therefore necessary our zero was one sitting and repeating this tradition of Barpat our Jeremiah raised an objection to our zero what device does one adopt in connection with the first ling if a pregnant animal was giving birth for the first time one can say Whatever is in the inside of this animal shall become a burnt offering if now the animal gives birth to a male it is a burnt offering consequently we see that an embryo is holy on its own account here zero replied to him this was taught with reference to a consecration for its value but is a consecration for its value strong enough to release from the holiness of the firstling yes and we have learned likewise all dedications which have received the permanent blemish prior to their dedication and were redeemed are subject to the law of the firstling and the priestly gifts now the reason why they are subject to the law of the firstling is because they were redeemed but if they were not redeemed they would be exempt from the law of the firstling consequently we see that a consecration for its value is strong enough to release the holiness of the firstling he raised an objection if one says whatever is in the inside of this animal shall be a burnt offering the mother may be shorn for its Will but must not be worked because the embryo within is thereby weakened. He said to him, Here too, it is a case of consecration for its value, but is a consecration for its value strong enough to forbid shearing and work of an animal? He replied to him, Yes, and we have learned likewise they become hollow as regards shearing and working. Now the reason is because they were redeemed, but before they were redeemed, they must not be worked. Consequently, we see that a consecration for its value makes it forbidden to work the animal. Here, Jeremiah raised an objection to him. Our Zerah, our mission says, With limbs of hollow, no exchange can be effected for dedicated embryos, nor with embryos for limbs. Now it says that one has no power to exchange with them the embryos, but they, the embryos can indeed become holy. Here, Zerah replied to him, Our mission is dealing with dedicated offspring which are already holy. If we are dealing with dedicated offspring, it is only in the inside of their Mother that they do not affect exchange we infer then that outside their mother they do affect exchange but have we not learned one cannot affect exchange with the offspring of a dedicated animal the mission above will represent the opinion of our Judah who holds that an animal's offspring affects exchange if the first part of our mission above is the opinion of our Judah it is only exchange which cannot be affected with limbs but the limbs are indeed dedicated but has not our Judah stated limbs do not become holy the case here is where he dedicated a limb the removal of which results in death here Jeremiah raised an objection to him our zero one can dedicate limbs and embryos but one has no power to exchange them here also we are dealing with offspring of dedications if the case is that of offspring of dedications why does the very to say above one can dedicate for are they not already holy Talmud Masti Mira what is meant is this one can dedicate limbs and can Effect exchange for them but one can effect no exchange with limbs for them dedicated animals and embryos which were dedicated while they were inside their mother cannot be exchanged now if the case in the mission just quoted refers to offsprings of dedications it is only in the inside of their mothers that they do not effect an exchange but outside their mother they do effect exchange but have we not learned offspring of dedicated animals do not effect an exchange this is the opinion of our Judah if it is the opinion of our Judah then how can limbs become holy for our Judah does not hold that if one says the foot of this animal shall be a burnt offering the whole becomes a burnt offering he replied to him here also the case is one of the dedication of a limb the loss of which renders the animal trifle must it be said that aim differ on that point for it was taught if one slaughtered a sin offering and found a four months old embryo alive inside one bury the states it is only eaten by the males of the priesthood within the hangings of the court and for one day and a night while another buried the taught it is eaten by all people it is eaten everywhere in the temple court and is eaten at all times what does this mean is it not that there is a difference of opinion among tanaim one master holding that dedication has effect on embryos and the other master holding that dedication has no effect on embryos know these tanaim of the buried above differ on this point one tana holding that the offspring of dedications are holy at birth while the other tana holds that the offspring of dedications are holy even in the inside of their mother or if you prefer another solution i may say both buried quoted above are the teaching of one tana one of these buried deals with the case where one dedicates an animal and then it becomes pregnant and the other where he dedicates it in a pregnant condition we have learned our Eliezer says Kilayim Trifa and Afoet is extracted by means of the Caesarean section of Tumtum and other Maphrodite do not themselves become holy nor cause holiness and Samuel said the expression do not themselves become holy means as regards becoming a substitute and the expression nor cause holiness means to effect an exchange and it has been taught said Armeir since they do not become holy how can they cause holiness you cannot find a case except where one dedicated an animal and then it became
have a regarding an unblemished embryo in the inside of an unblemished animal all the authorities agree that the embryo is holy as such the point at issue is with reference to an embryo in the inside of a blemished animal Barpata holding that since the mother is not holy as such except for its value the embryo also is not holy as such except for its value whereas our Yohanan says an embryo is not considered the thigh of its mother and although its mother is not holy as such the embryo Nevertheless is holy as such said our Jose is it not the case with reference to dedications that if one says this foot shall be etc. Talmud, Mosti Mirabi our rabbis have taught are we to suppose that if one says this foot shall be a burnt offering the whole animal becomes a burnt offering the text states all that any man giveth of it unto the Lord shall be holy of it unto the Lord but not the whole of it the animal unto the Lord I might think that if the animal becomes holy therefore the text states it shall be holy how is one to act it must be sold for the requirements of burnt offerings and its money is holy except for the value of its limb this is the teaching of our Meir and our Judah our Jose and our Simeon however say whence do we derive that if one says the foot of this animal shall be a burnt offering the whole animal becomes a burnt offering because scripture says all that any man giveth of it shall be unto the Lord when it further says it shall be holy this includes it. Whole of it the animal the master said it shall be sold for requirements of a burnt offering but does not he the purchaser bring an animal for a burnt offering with the loss of limb said Rabbah it is a case where he the purchaser says I undertake to bring a burnt offering which can live said our his daughter Judah agrees where he dedicated a part of the animal the removal of which renders the animal true for Rabbah says a part the removal of which renders the animal nibla and our she's hate says a part the removal of which kills the animal what is the practical difference between our his and Rabbah the difference is whether a trifle can live our his holds according to the one who says that a trifle cannot live whereas Rabbah will hold according to the one who says that a trifle can live and what is the practical difference between Rabbah and our she's hate the difference between them is as regards the ruling of our Eliezer for our Eliezer says if the thigh of an animal was removed and it Hollow thereof if the animal is nibble Rabbah will agree with our Eliezer whereas our she's hate will not agree with our Eliezer they raised an objection said Rabbi I favor the opinion of our Judah where the dedication is a part of the animal the removal of which will not result in death and the opinion of our Jose where the dedication is a part of the animal the removal of which results in death now can we not infer from this that our Jose differs with our Judah even in connection with the removal of a vital limb there is no difficulty as regards the words I favor the opinion of our Judah where the dedication is a part of the animal the removal of which will not result in death since our Jose does differ in this but from the words and the opinion of our Jose where the dedication is a part of the animal the removal of which will result in death cannot we infer from this that our Judah differs shall we say this refutes all no the statement is defective and must be read thus the teaching of our Jose is acceptable to our Judah regarding a part of the animal the removal of which results in death for even our Judah does not differ with our Jose save in regard to the dedication of a part of the animal the removal of which does not result in death but in regard to the dedication of a part the removal of which results in death he agrees with him Rabbah inquired what of the bird shall we say scripture says beast and this is not a beast or perhaps shall we note that scripture says Corban offering and the bird is also an offering let it remain undecided Rabbah inquired if one dedicated a limb for its value what of holiness as such resting on it does one say since one limb is dedicated the whole becomes holy for value and since there rests upon the animal the holiness for its value there also rests on it dedication as such or perhaps we use a single mego but not a double mego but why cannot Rabbah solve the inquiry from his own teaching for Rabbah said if one Dedicated a male ram for its value it is dedicated as such there he dedicated the whole animal but here he only dedicated one limb what therefore is the ruling let it stand undecided I inquired of rabbi if one dedicated a limb what of the shearing why not solve it from what has been taught scripture said nor shear the first ling of thy sheep thus implying that you may shear where the first ling belongs to thee and to others gentiles there no holiness rested on it at all but here holiness rested on it the limb another version there he has not the power to dedicate it whereas here he has the power to dedicate the rest of the animal I inquired of rabbi if one dedicated the skin of an animal what of working the animal come and here if one says whatever is in the inside of this animal shall be a burnt offering shearing is permitted but work with it is forbidden on account of the weakening of the embryo within he replied to him when the very the just Quoted states but work with it is forbidden it means rabbinically if so the shearing too should be forbidden he said to him work with the embryo which weakens it the rabbis prohibited but shearing the rabbis did not prohibit Abbe inquired of our Joseph if it the mother is a peace offering and its embryo is hollow and he slaughtered the mother within the temple court what is the ruling according to the one who holds that offspring of dedications are holy at birth and not before have we here a case of slaughtering hollow in the temple court or not Talmud Masti Mura here Joseph said to him Abbe can we apply here the text if the place be too far for thee then thou shalt kill Abbe inquired of our Joseph if it the mother is hollow and its embryo is a peace offering and one slaughtered it the mother without the temple court does he incur the penalty for slaughtering dedicated animals without the temple court or not he replied to him can we apply here the text even that they may bring them unto the Lord another version here Joseph replied to him if the animal is fit for the tent of meeting one incurs a penalty for slaughtering it outside the temple court but for an animal which is not fit for the tent of meeting there is no penalty incurred for slaughtering without the temple court mission anything which has become subject to the law of Teramah through an admixture can affect a second mixture only in proportion to leaven through Teramah can affect another dough only in proportion drawn water can disqualify a only in proportion water of purification becomes ritually fit only with the putting of ashes in the water a grave area cannot create a grave area the separation of Teramah cannot be repeated an exchange cannot be used to affect another exchange the offspring of a dedicated animal cannot affect an exchange our Judah says the offspring of a dedicated animal can affect an exchange they said to him a Dedicated animal can affect exchange, but neither the offspring of a dedicated animal nor an exchange can affect exchange. Amara, whose opinion is here represented, our high B. Ab reported in the name of our Yohan, and it will not be that of our Eliezer, for we have learned if Sei of Terima has fallen into less than a hundred Sei of Hullin, the admixture becoming forbidden to non priests, and something fell from the mixture into another place of Hullin, our Eliezer says the mixture is considered certain Terima, whereas the sages say the first mixture can affect the second only in proportion to leaven through Terima can affect other dough only in proportion. Our high B. Ab reported in the name of our Yohan, and the mission will not be the opinion of our Eliezer, for we have learned if leaven of Hullin and of Terima fell into dough, and there was in neither a sufficient quantity to leaven the dough, but both were capable of leavening when combined. Our Eliezer says we go by the last. Leaven, whereas the sages say whether the forbidden thing terima fell first into the dough or last a quantity capable of leavening is always required in order that the dough should become forbidden drawn water can disqualify amikwe only in proportion whose opinion is here represented our high b ever reported in the name of our yohan and it is that of our Eliezer b jacob for it has been taught our Eliezer b jacob said if amikwe contains 21 sei of rainwater one can bring 19 sei and open a sluice near talmud masti mirabi and the collected waters are clean ritually for collected drawn waters are rendered clean by the greater part in the amikwe being rainwater and by being conducted through a channel we can infer from this that according to the opinion of the rabbis drawn waters are not rendered clean by the greater part of rainwater and by being conducted through a channel then the ruling which when rabin came he reported in the name of our yohan and Collected water which has been drawn entirely through a channel is ritually clean will represent neither the opinion of the rabbis nor that of our Eliza rather said our papa the words in proportion mean according to the number of the vessels and at the mission is the opinion of Joseph B. Honey for it has been taught if three log of collected water fell into a mikwe if the waters came from two or three vessels or even from four or five vessels they disqualify the mikwe Joseph B. Honey says if the waters came from two or three vessels they disqualify the mikwe but if from four or five vessels they do not disqualify the mikwe the waters of purification become ritually fit etc whose opinion is here represented our high B. Ab reported in the name of our Yohan and it is not the opinion
Bottom of the vessel and if he wishes he puts a far on top of the water and what is the reason of Artana he can answer you the latter part of the verse is to be strictly interpreted and the text and running water shall be put there too teaches us that one must mix the ashes and the water together but why do you see fit to say that the latter part of the verse is to be strictly interpreted perhaps the first part of the text is to be strictly interpreted and the text in a vessel teaches us that the waters must be fresh in the vessel you cannot interpret the text in this way just as we find with regard to all other cases that which makes the water ritually fit is placed on top so here that which makes the water of purification ritually fit is put on top a grave area cannot create a grave area etc our mission will not represent the opinion of our Eliezer, for we have learned our Eliezer says a grave area creates a grave area whereas the sages say a grave area does not Create a grave area according to the rabbis up to how much when Ardimi came from Palestine he reported in the name of Reshlech he reported in the name of Arsimian B. Abitalmud, Mosti Mura three fields and two furrows length how much is a furrow's length a hundred cubits as it has been taught he who plows a grave creates a beth hop the length of the furrow and how much is the length of the furrow a hundred cubits the separation of Terimah cannot be repeated etc. Our mission is the opinion of our Akiba for we have learned if partners separated Terimah one after the other our Eliezer says the Terimah of both of them is valid whereas our Akiba says the Terimah of both of them is not valid the sages however say if the first of the partners separated Terimah according to the right quantity then the Terimah of the second one is not valid but if the first one did not separate Terimah according to the right quantity then the Terimah of the second partner is valid in exchange. Cannot be used to affect another exchange, etc. What is the reason since scripture says and the exchange thereof implying but not the exchange of an exchange that offspring of a dedicated animal cannot affect an exchange since scripture says it implying it can affect exchange but not the offspring of a dedicated animal. Our Judah says the offspring of a dedicated animal affects an exchange for scripture says shall be thus including the offspring of a dedicated animal and the rabbis the object of it. Text is to include an exchange in error as possessing the same validity as a deliberate exchange mission of birds and meal offerings do not affect exchange since the law of exchange only applies to an animal. A congregation or partners cannot affect exchange since it says he shall not alter it nor change it, thus implying that an individual can affect exchange but a congregation or partners cannot affect exchange. One cannot affect exchange with objects dedicated for temple repairs, said R. Simeon now is not tithe already implied for what purpose then is tithe specially mentioned it is in order to make a comparison with it and to teach us that just as tithe is a private offering so all exchange of dedications must be a private offering thus excluding congregational offerings and just as tithe is a dedication for the altar so exchanges can be effected only with dedications for the altar thus excluding offerings dedicated for temple repairs Gemara our rabbis have taught one. Might think that one can affect exchange with dedications for temple repairs the text however says Corbin offering implying that exchange only applies to what is called Corbin thus excluding dedications for temple repairs which are not called Corbin and are not dedications for temple repairs called Corbin has it not been taught if you interpret the word Corbin I can understand it as including even dedications for temple repairs which are called Corbin since it says and we have brought it. Lord's offering etc. The text however states and bringeth it not unto the door of the tent of meeting we therefore say as follows in respect of anything which comes to the door of the tent of meeting one is guilty of the transgression of slaughtering dedicated animals without the temple court but in respect of anything which does not come to the door of the tent of meeting one is not guilty of the transgression of slaughtering dedicated animals without the temple court consequently we see that dedications for temple repairs are called Corbin set our hand this offers no difficulty this is the opinion of our Simeon and that is the opinion of the rabbis according to our Simeon dedications for temple repairs are called Corbin and according to the rabbis they are not called Corbin and are not dedications for temple repairs called it Corbin surely it is written and we have brought the Lord's Corbin offering dedications for temple repairs are called the Lord's offering but they are not called an offering for the Lord. Our rabbis have taught he shall not search whether it be good or bad. Now why is this mentioned? Has not scripture already said he shall not alter it nor change it a good for a bad or a bad for a good, etc. Because it says he shall not alter it nor change it, implying either a private offering or a congregational offering, either a dedication for the altar or a dedication for temple repairs, and that which is brought obligatorily in order to avoid this. Interpretation scripture says he shall not search said our Simeon now was not tithe implied, and for what purpose was tithe specially mentioned in order to teach you that just as tithe is a private offering, a dedication for the altar, something which comes obligatorily and something which does not come through a partnership, so all animals exchanged must be a private offering, a dedication for the altar, something which comes obligatorily Talmud, Mosti Mirabi, and something which does not come. Through a partnership, Rabbi says, and for what purpose now is tithe specially mentioned in order to infer the cases of one which became tithe through a change of name and the exchange of actual tithe, and further to teach you that that which becomes tithe through a change of name is offered up, whereas the exchange of actual tithe is not offered up, that which becomes tithe through a change of name is redeemed, whereas the exchange of actual tithe is not redeemed, and exchange of actual tithe has effect both on what is fit unblemished and what is not fit blemished, whereas a change of name of tithe has effect only on what is fit. The question was asked because the divine law includes the case of that which became tithe through a change of name, should it therefore be inferior in holiness? Yes, for we say what the law has included is included, but what it has not included is not included, and whence do you derive the said Arhuna, the son of our Joshua, because it is made the subject of a fresh statement and therefore we do not go beyond the anomalous feature set our nom and be Isaac to rob according to our Simeon who says exchange is affected with something which comes obligatorily is it only an obligatory burnt offering that can affect exchange but not a free will burnt offering he answered him a free will burnt offering also since he took upon himself to offer it up it can affect exchange and our Simeon's teaching is necessary only for the case of a burnt offering which comes from surpluses of sacrificial appropriations now what is his view if he holds with the authority who says that the surpluses go for free will gifts of the congregation then actually exchange cannot be affected since a congregation cannot affect exchange then our Simeon will hold with the authority who says that the surpluses go for free will gifts of individuals now from whom have we heard this opinion from our Eliezer but have we not heard him explicitly state that exchange is affected for it has been taught a burnt offering which came from the surpluses can affect exchange. This is the teaching of our Eliezer. Our Simeon agrees with him on one point and differs from him on another. He agrees with him on one point that surpluses are applied to gifts for individuals and differs from him on another point. For our Eliezer holds a burnt offering brought from surpluses can affect exchange, whereas our Simeon holds it cannot affect exchange. If so, as regards the inquiry of Arab, and if he set apart a guilt offering with which to obtain atonement and made an exchange for it, and the first animal then became blemished and he redeemed it for another which became lost, and he obtained atonement through another guilt offering, and the lost animal was then found and was automatically transformed into a burnt offering. What is the ruling as regards making an exchange with it? The burnt offering whose opinion does this inquiry presuppose it can hardly be that of our Simeon, for you say that our Simeon holds that a burnt offering which comes from surpluses cannot affect exchange. Our Robin's inquiry is thus if you can find a tenant who holds our Simeon's opinion who says that one cannot exchange repeatedly and holds also our Eliezer's opinion who says that a burnt offering which comes from the surpluses can affect exchange. What of exchanging it again with reference to two bodies, different animals, and one kind of holiness? What is the ruling? And if you adopt the opinion that one kind of holiness cannot affect exchange again, what is the ruling in the case of two kinds of holiness and one body? Let this question remain CHAPTERI -E Mishnah Talmud, Mosti Mira. There are laws relating to the sacrifices of an individual which do not apply to congregational sacrifices and laws relating to congregational sacrifices which do not apply to the sacrifices of individuals for sacrifices of an individual can affect exchange, whereas congregational sacrifices cannot affect. Exchange sacrifices of an individual can be both males and females whereas congregational sacrifices can be only males responsibility remains for the sacrifices of individuals and their
Of Iaspix Gamara sacrifices of an individual can affect exchange etc. But is this a general rule? Is there not the case of birds which are a sacrifice of an individual and yet they do not affect exchange? The Mishnah speaks only of animals, but is there not the case of the offspring of a dedicated animal which is a sacrifice of an individual and yet does not affect exchange? This view represents the opinion of Arjuna who says the offspring of a dedicated animal affects exchange, but is there not the case of a substitute itself which is a sacrifice of an individual and a substitute cannot affect an exchange? The Mishnah only refers to the principal sacrifice, and now that you have arrived at this explanation, you can even say that the Mishnah will be in agreement with the opinion of the rabbis, for the Mishnah only refers to the principal sacrifice. Sacrifices of an individual can be both males and females, but is this a general rule? Is there not the case of a burnt offering which is a sacrifice of an individual and can only be a male and not a female. There is the case of the burnt offering of a bird for it has been taught unblemished condition and male sex for purposes of sacrifice are required only of cattle but unblemished condition and male sex are not required of birds but is there not the case of a sin offering which is a sacrifice of an individual and is a female and not a male there is a goat offered by a prince which is a male but is there not the case of a guilt offering which is a sacrifice of an individual and is a male and not a female we mean in the mission a sacrifice which can be brought equally by an individual and a congregation whereas a guilt offering can be brought only by an individual but not by a congregation and if you prefer another solution I may say does the mission say there are laws which relate to all sacrifices it says there are laws which relate to sacrifices and what are these peace offerings and it tells us that if one wishes to bring a female animal one may do so and if one wishes to bring a male animal one may do so responsibility remains for sacrifices of an individual etc. Whence is this proof for our rabbis have taught scripture says everything upon his day this teaches us that the additional offerings may be offered up all day the text upon his day teaches us that if the day passed and he did not offer them he is not responsible for them one might think that one is not responsible for their drink offerings although he offered up the sacrifice the text however states and their meal offering and their drink offerings their meal offerings and drink offerings even by night and their meal offerings and drink offerings even on the morrow Rosh Lakish says we derive this from your scripture says beside the sabbaths of the Lord and both texts are necessary for if the divine law had only written besides the sabbaths of the Lord I might have thought that the drink offerings May be only offered by day but not by night. Therefore, scripture says, and their meal offering and their drink offerings, and if the divine law had written only their meal offering and their drink offerings and had not written besides the Sabbaths of the Lord, I might have thought that the drink offerings are only offered by night and not by day, but wherein lies the difference because in respect of dedication the night follows the day. Therefore, both texts are necessary, but our drink offerings offered by night surely it has been taught. I can only infer from the text that such things as it is customary to offer up by night, e.g., limbs, fat pieces are brought to the altar, burnt with the setting of the sun, and consumed all through the night. Things, however, which it is customary to offer by day, e.g., the fistful of the meal offering, frankincense, and drink offerings, whence do I know that he may bring them to the altar and burn them with the setting of the sun, with the setting of the sun, say you. Did you not just say things which it is customary to offer by day say therefore before the setting of the sun whence do we derive that these can be consumed all through the night the text states this is the law of the burnt offering this implies something additional now in any case the above passage mentions the drink offerings as something which is offered by day said Rami Bihaba there is no difficulty here the reference is to dedication and there to offering said Rabba to him if the drink offerings indeed can become dedicated by night they can be offered by night for it has been taught this is the general rule whatsoever is offered by day is rendered holy only by day whatsoever is offered by night is rendered holy only by night whatsoever is offered both by day and night is rendered holy by day and night rather said our Joseph delete drink offerings from the very above when our went up from Babylon to Palestine he found our Jeremiah sitting and lecturing in the name of our Joshua B. Levi, whence do we deduce that drink offerings which accompany a sacrifice can only be offered by day? The text states, and for your drink offerings and for your peace offerings, and we say just as peace offerings are offered by day, so drink offerings are offered by day. He Ardimi said, If I could have found a messenger, I would have written a letter and sent it to our Joseph in Babylon Talmud. Mosti Mirabi to say that he should not delete the case of drink offerings from it. Above Beritha, and yet there is no contradiction here. We are dealing with drink offerings which accompany a sacrifice, while there we are dealing with drink offerings which are brought by themselves. And if he had found someone, could he have written the letter? Did not our Abba, the son of our high B. Abba, report in the name of our Yohan, and those who write the traditional teachings are punished like those who burn the Torah, and he who learns from them the writings receives no reward, and our Judah B. Nam in the Metrishman of Resh Lakish gave the following as exposition the verse says write thou these words and then says for after the tenor of these words thus teaching you that matters received as oral traditions you are not permitted to recite from writing and that written things biblical passages you are not permitted to recite from memory and the tenor of the school of our Ishmael taught scripture says write thou these words implying that these words you may write but you may not write. Traditional laws the answer was given perhaps the case is different in regard to a new interpretation for our Yohanan and Resh Lakish used to peruse the book of Gad on Sabbaths and explain their attitude in this matter scripture says it is time for the Lord to work they have made void thy law explaining this as follows it is better that one letter of the Torah should be uprooted than that the whole Torah should be forgotten said our Papa now that you say that drink offerings which are Brought by themselves are offered even by night. If drink offerings happen to be at hand by night, we can dedicate them by night and offer them by night. Said our Joseph, the son of our Shimei, to our Papa, there is a very which supports your dictum. This is the general rule. Whatsoever is offered by day is only dedicated by day, and whatsoever is offered by night is dedicated by night. Said our Abba Yehovah, and the rise of the morning dawn disqualifies drink offerings like the limbs of the daily evening sacrifice. When our Dimi came from Palestine, he reported that our Yohanan said in the name of our Simeon, Bijah Hosadok, Scripture says these things ye shall do unto the Lord in your set feasts. This refers to the obligatory sacrifices which are brought on holy days beside your vows and your free will offerings. Teach concerning vows and free will offerings that they are offered on the intermediate days of the festival for your burnt offerings. Now, of what kind of burnt offering does the verse? Speak of a free will burnt offering is it not already written your free will offerings and if of a burnt offering which was vowed is it not already written your vows the text therefore can only refer to the burnt offerings of a woman brought after childbirth and the burnt offering of a leper and for your meal offerings now of what kind of meal offering does the verse speak of a free will meal offering is not this already written and if of a meal offering which was vowed is not this already written the text therefore can only refer to a sinner's meal offering and a meal offering of jealousy and for your drink offerings and for your peace offerings implies an analogy between drink offerings and peace offerings as follows just as peace offerings are offered by day so drink offerings which accompany a sacrifice are offered by day and for your peace offerings includes peace offerings of a Nazi right said Abbe to him and why not say that the text includes peace offerings of it Passover for if the text includes peace offerings of a Nazi right there are sacrifices which are the subject of a vow or a free will dedication and we have learned this is the general rule whatsoever is the subject of a vow or a free will dedication may be offered on a private pamma and whatsoever is not the subject of a vow or a free will dedication must not be offered on a private pamma and it has been taught meal offerings and offerings in connection with a Nazi right may be offered on a private pamma this is the teaching of our mayor delete from here the case of a Nazi right but is there an authority who holds that a Nazi right is not the subject of a vow or a free will offering lo it is written and it came to pass after 40 years that Absalom said to the king pray thee let me go and pay my vow which I vowed unto the Lord in Hebron for thy servant vow to vow etc and now does this not refer to the sacrifice no it refers to the vow itself the vow itself was it made in Hebron was it not made in Geshur said Araha some say Rabbi son of Arhan and Absalom only went in order to bring sheep from Hebron so indeed it stands to reason for if you say that he went to Hebron to offer up would he leave Jerusalem and go to offer up in Hebron then what do you say that he went to bring sheep from Hebron then why does it say which I
offering whose owners died that the rules concerning these apply only to an individual but not a congregation similarly the rules concerning the sin offering whose owners have procured atonement and a sin offering whose year has passed applies only to an individual but not a congregation Gemara our rabbis have taught why does scripture say and if he bring a lamb for a sin offering whence do we derive that if one dedicated a sin offering and it became lost and he separated another animal in its place and the first animal was then found and both are standing before us whence do we derive that he may bring whichever one he chooses the text states and if he bring a sin offering one might think that he may bring both of them the text however states he shall bring it implying one but not two and what becomes of the second sin offering said our ham but it has been taught our judah says it is left to pasture whereas our simeon says it is left to die but does indeed our judah hold that it is left to pasture. Have we not heard our Judah to hold that it is left to die? Reverse the names in the above. Bury that as follows. Our Judah says it is left to die, whereas our Simeon says it is left to pasture. But does indeed our Simeon hold that it is left to pasture? Did not our Simeon say five sin offerings are left to die? Rather, you need not at all reverse the names of the buried above. And there is no difficulty there. We are dealing with a case where the first sin offering was lost when the second animal was separated for a sin offering. And here we are dealing with a case where the first sin offering was lost at the time of the atonement by means of the second animal. And if you prefer another solution, I may say in both cases we suppose the first sin offering was lost at the time of the separating of the second animal. And yet there is no difficulty. This is the opinion of our Judah according to Rabbi, and that is the opinion of our Judah according to the Rabbis. But is there an authority who holds that a congregational sin offering whose owners procured atonement is left to die Talmud, Mastim Yerubi has it not been taught likewise our Jose said the children of the captivity that were come out of the exile offered burnt offerings 12 bullocks 96 rams 77 lambs 12 he goats for a sin offering all this was a burnt offering unto the Lord but can a sin offering be brought as a burnt offering said Rabbah it means like a burnt offering in this respect just as a burnt offering must not be eaten so that sin offering was not to be eaten for our Jose used to say they brought the 12 he goats for the sin of idolatry and Rab Judah reported in the name of Samuel on account of the idolatry which they committed in the time of Zedekiah now assuming that the one who holds that a congregational sin offering whose owners procured atonement is left to die also holds that a sin offering whose owners have died is left to die is there not here a case where the owners have died and yet the sin offering is offered said our papa even according to the one who holds that a congregational sin offering whose owners have procured atonement is left to die a congregational sin offering whose owners have died is not left to die for a congregation does not die once does our papa derive this shall we say because scripture says instead of thy fathers shall be thy children if this be so the same should apply to the sacrifice of an individual rather this is the reason why the law of the owners of a sin offering who died does not apply to a congregation because we make an inference from the case of the goats brought on festivals and new moons since the divine law says bring them from the offerings of the temple treasury now perhaps the owners of this money have died must you therefore not admit that a congregation does not die and if you prefer another solution i may say when these sin offerings goats were offered they were Offered on behalf of those still alive since scripture says but many of the priests and levites and chiefs of the fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes wept with a loud voice and many shouted aloud for joy perhaps the survivors were only a minority you cannot say this since the text continues so that the people could not discern the noise of the shouting from the noise of the weeping of the people but how could they bring a sacrifice for idolatry were they not willful sinners of idolatry in the days of Zedekiah said our Yohan and it was a special decision so indeed it stands to reason for should you not say so there is no difficulty as regards the twelve bullocks and the twelve goats for this corresponds with the twelve tribes but as regards rams and lambs with reference to whom were they brought you must say therefore that this was a special decision and here too it was a special Decision we have learned elsewhere when Joseph B. Joezer of Zirda and Joseph B. Yohanan of Jerusalem died the great clusters the scholars came to an end what is the meaning of Eshkol the great clusters a man in whom all is contained our Judah reported in the name of Samuel all the great clusters who arose from the days of Moses until Joseph B. Joezer learned Torah like Moses our teacher from that time onward they did not learn Torah like Moses our teacher but did not Rab Judah report in the name of Samuel 3000 Halachoth were forgotten during the period of mourning for Moses those laws which were forgotten were forgotten but those which were learned they learned like Moses our teacher but has it not been taught after the death of Moses if those who pronounced unclean were in the majority they the rabbis declared the object unclean and if those who pronounced clean were in the majority they the rabbis declared it clean their acumen diminished but what they had Learned they learned like Moses our teacher it has been taught all the great clusters who arose in Israel from the days of Moses until the death of Joseph B. Joezer of Zirda were free from all dofi taint from that time onward some matter of taint was found in them but has it not been taught there is the story of a certain Hasid who groaned from a pain in his heart and when the doctors were consulted they said that there was no remedy for him unless he sucked hot milk from a goat every morning they brought a goat and bound it to the feet of his bed and he used to suck milk from it next day his friends came to visit him when they saw the goat they exclaimed a robber in arms is in the house and shall we go in to visit him they left him immediately when he died they sat down and made investigation and found no other sin in him except that of the keeping of the goat he the Hasid too at his death said I myself know that I have not sinned except in the keeping of this goat. Having thus transgressed the teaching of my colleagues for the sages taught one must not rear small cattle in the land of Israel and it is also an established fact with us that wherever the Talmud speaks of a certain Hasid it refers either to our Judah B. Baba or our Judah B. Ali. Now these rabbis lived many generations after Joseph B. Joezer of Zirda Talmud. Mas Timura said our Joseph the word Dofi here means dispute e.g. the dispute relating to laying on of hands but does not Joseph B. Joezer himself differ with reference to the law of laying on of hands when he differed it was in his latter years when his mental powers declined the above text stated Rab Judah reported in the name of Samuel 3000 traditional laws were forgotten during the period of mourning for Moses they said to Joshua ask he replied it is not in heaven that the Israelites said to Samuel ask he replied scripture says these are the commandments implying that since the promulgation of these Commandments no prophet has now the right to introduce anything new said our Isaac the smith also the law relating to a sin offering whose owners have died was forgotten during the period of mourning for Moses that the Israelites said to Phinehas ask he replied to them it is not in heaven they said to Eliezer ask he replied these are the commandments implying that since the promulgation of these commandments no prophet has now the right to introduce anything new Rab Judah reported in the name of Rab when Moses departed this world for the garden of Eden he said to Joshua ask me concerning all the doubts you have he replied to him my master have I ever left you for one hour and gone elsewhere did you not write concerning me in the Torah but his servant Joshua the son of Nun departed not out of the tabernacle immediately the strength of Moses weakened and Joshua forgot three hundred laws and there arose in his mind seven hundred doubts concerning laws and all the Israelites rose up to kill him the Holy One blessed be he then said to him Joshua it is not possible to tell you go and occupy their attention in war as it says now after the death of Moses the servant of the Lord it came to pass that the Lord spake and it further says prepare you vittles for within three days etc it has been taught 8700 kal wahammer and gazirish and specifications of the scribes were forgotten during the period of mourning for Moses said R. Aboah nevertheless Othniel the son of Kenaz restored these forgotten teachings as a result of his dialectics as it says and Othniel the son of Kenaz the brother of Caleb took it and he gave him his daughter to wife and why was her name called Ixas said Aryohan and because whosoever saw her was angry with his wife and it came to pass as she came unto him that she moved him to ask of her father a field and she alighted what is not off her ass what does the word w it is namin rabba Reported in the name of our Isaac, she said to him, Just as an ass when it has no food in its trough immediately cries out, so a woman when she has no wheat in her house cries out immediately, as it says, and Caleb said unto her, What wouldst thou? And she answered, Give me a blessing, for thou hast given me a southland, implying a house dry devoid of all goodness, money,
from evil that it may not grieve me and God granted him and which he requested oh that thou wouldst bless me indeed with Torah and enlarge my border with pupils that thy hand might be with me that my studies may not be forgotten from my heart and that thou wouldst keep me from evil that I may need friends like myself that it may not grieve me that the evil inclination may not have power over me so as to prevent me from studying if thou doest so it is well but if not I shall go with my grief. To the grave immediately God granted him that which he requested you find a similar example the poor man and the man of medium wealth meet together the Lord lighteneth both their eyes when the pupil questions his teacher and says to him teach me Torah if he teaches him the Lord enlightens the eyes of both of them and if not the rich and poor meet together the Lord is the maker of them all he who made this one wise can make him a fool and he who has made this one a fool can make him wise this is. The teaching of our Nathan Arjuna the prince says if thou wouldst bless me indeed by multiplying and increasing and enlarge my border with sons and daughters and that thine hand might be with me in business and thou wouldst keep me from evil that I have no headache here ignore I ache that it may not grieve me that the evil inclination may not have power over me so as to prevent me from studying if thou doest so it is well but if not I will go with my grief to the grave and God granted him. That which he requested likewise you say the poor man and the man of medium wealth have met together the Lord lighteneth both their eyes when the poor man goes to the donor and says assist him if he assists him it is well but if not the rich and the poor meet together the Lord is the maker of them all he who made this one rich can make him poor and he who made this one poor can make him rich said our Simeon what do we find as regards etc our rabbis taught our Simeon says five sin offerings are left. To die an offspring of a dedicated animal the substitute of a sin offering a sin offering whose owner has died a sin offering whose owner has procured atonement and a sin offering whose year is past now you cannot apply the law of the offspring of a dedicated animal to a congregation because a congregation does not bring a female animal for an offering you cannot also apply the law of the substitute of a sin offering to a congregation because a congregation cannot effect exchange you. Cannot also apply the law of a sin offering whose owner has died to a congregation because a congregation does not die with regard to the cases of a sin offering whose owner has procured atonement or whose year is past. We do not as yet know shall we say then that these have the same rule in the case both of a congregation and an individual. I will tell you let the cases which are not explicitly stated be derived by analogy from the cases explicitly stated as follows just as the cases explicitly stated apply to an individual and not to a congregation. So the cases regarding the owners of a sin offering who have procured atonement and a sin offering whose year has passed only apply to an individual and not to a congregation. Talmud, Mosheen Yerubi, but can we form an analogy between the case where there is an alternative and a case where there is none said Rush Lakish for sin offerings were specified to the Israelites on Sinai to be left to die and the rule was extended to. 5. Now if you suppose that these were congregational sin offerings are three of them ever brought by a congregation then you must admit that we form an analogy between the cases not explicitly stated and those explicitly stated are Nathan says only one sin offering was specified to the Israelites on Mount Sinai and the rule was extended to all the five sin offerings but if that is so let us see in what class they learned it whether in that of the sin offerings of an individual or of a congregation there were two forgettings and consequently they were in a difficulty if you should think that the rule applies to the sin offering of a congregation can these be brought by a congregation then it is proved from here that we form an analogy between the cases not explicitly stated and the cases explicitly stated just as in the cases explicitly stated the sin offering is brought by an individual and not by a congregation so in the cases not explicitly stated the sin offering is Brought by an individual and not by a congregation mission in some ways the law relating to dedications carries greater weight than that relating to exchange and in some ways that relating to exchange carries greater weight than that relating to dedications in some ways the law relating to dedications carries greater weight than that relating to exchange for dedicated animals can affect exchange whereas one substituted cannot affect exchange a congregation or partners can dedicate. But cannot affect exchange we can dedicate embryos and limbs but we cannot affect exchange with them the law relating to exchange carries greater weight than that relating to dedication since exchange has effect on a permanently blemished animal and it does not become Holland Talmud, Mas Timura so as to be sheared of its will and worked our Jose son of Arjuna says an exchange in error is put on a level with an intentional exchange but a dedication in error is not put on a level with. An intentional dedication, our Eliezer says, Kill a YIM Trafay foe is extracted by means of a Caesarean section, a tum tum and other maphrodite neither become sacred nor can they cause dedication. Gemara, what is the reason of our Jose son of our Judah? Scripture says, Shall be holy, thus including the case of an exchange in error as on a level with an intentional exchange. How is an exchange in error being on a level with an intentional exchange to be understood? Said Hezekiah, where he has a mistaken opinion that it is permissible to exchange. Now, in the case of exchange, he is punishable with lashes, whereas in the case of dedications, he is not punishable with lashes. Another version, in the case of exchange, the substitute is holy, whereas in the case of dedications, there is no holiness. Or Yohanan says, Where he intended making an exchange with a burnt offering and he made the exchange with a peace offering, or where he intended making an exchange with a peace offering and he made the exchange. With a burnt offering now in the case of exchange the animal becomes holy whereas in the case of dedications it is not holy another version where he intended saying a black ox and he said a white ox in the case of exchange he is punishable with lashes whereas in the case of dedications he is not punishable with lashes Resh says where he thought that the one animal can be quit of holiness while the other the exchanged animal enters into holiness similarly with reference to dedications where he thought that if a blemish shows itself in dedicated animals they are eaten without redemption now in the case of exchange he is punishable with lashes whereas in the case of dedications he is not punishable with lashes Arshis hate says where he says I shall enter this house dedicate and exchange with full knowledge of what I am doing and then he entered exchanged and dedicated without knowing it now as regards the exchanging he is punishable with lashes whereas as Regards the dedications he is not punishable with lashes. R. Eliezer says, Kill a YIM Trif, etc. said Samuel, they are neither holy as regards exchange nor can they confer holiness through exchange on others. It was taught, Rabbi said, but since they are not holy themselves, how can they confer holiness? This is possible only in the case where one dedicated an animal and it afterwards became Trif or dedicated an embryo in its mother's womb and it was extracted through the Caesarean section. But with regard to Kilim Tum Tum and Hermaphrodite, you cannot explain these cases except with reference to embryos of dedicated animals, and this accords with the view of Arjuna who said an offspring of a dedicated animal can affect exchange. Said Rabbi, what is the reason of R. Eliezer? They are like an unclean animal, just as an unclean animal is not offered and bodily consecration cannot attach to it, so these are not offered and no bodily consecration attaches to them, said R. But is there not the case of a blemished animal which is not offered and yet there attaches to it bodily consecration? A blemished animal belongs to the category of animals which are offered up. If this is so, what of trophy which also belongs to a category which is offered? Rather, said Rabbi, it resembles an unclean animal just as an unclean animal is disqualified on account of the condition of its body. So all these cases are disqualified on account of the condition of the body, thus excluding the case of a blemished animal which is disqualified in virtue of a mere deficiency. Said are added to Rabbi, are there not the cases of anything too long or too short mentioned in the scriptural passage? And these are disqualifications of the whole body. Rather, said Rabbi, it must be like an unclean animal as follows. Just as in the case of an unclean animal, there is none offered in the same category and it is not subject to the law of exchange. So in all cases where there is none offered in the same category the law of exchange is not applicable thus excluding a blemished animal since there are other animals offered from the same category will you perhaps object that a trifa too has other animals which are offered from the same category I answer that a trifa animal is not on a PAR with the case of a blemished animal an unclean animal is forbidden to be eaten and a trifa is also forbidden to be eaten to the exclusion of a blemished animal which is permitted to be eaten. Said Samuel if one has dedicated a trifa a permanent blemish is required in order to redeem it can you not prove from here that one may redeem dedicated animals in order to give dogs to eat rather say it is dedicated and
Wherever the animal is not offered bodily consecration does not attach to it. Chapteri I mission the following are dedications whose young and exchanges are in the same class as themselves. The young of peace offerings and their exchanges, their young and the young of their young till the end of time are regarded as peace offerings requiring laying on of hands, drink offerings and the waving of the breast and shoulder. Gemara since it states the young and the young of their young what? Need is there for thee until the end of time. Artana of the Mishnah heard our Eliezer state that the young of a peace offering is not offered as a peace offering. Thereupon Artana said to him, Not only do I not agree with you with regard to their young, but I even do not agree with you with regard to the young born until the end of time. Whence do we derive this? Our rabbis have taught scripture says a male. This includes the young. Now have we not here an inference from minor to major even? Exchange which is not reared in holiness is offered. How much more should the young of a dedication which is reared in holiness be offered? The case of exchange is different since it applies to all dedications, whereas the rule of the young does not apply to all dedications, and since it does not apply to all dedications, therefore the young is not offered. The text therefore states a male, thus including the young as being offered. The text of female, this includes exchange. I have so far only. The young of unblemished animals and the exchange of unblemished animals. Whence do we derive the cases of the young of blemished animals and the exchange of blemished animals as being offered? Scripture says, if it be a male, this includes the young of blemished animals, and the words, if it be a female, include the exchange of blemished animals. Said our Safar to Abay, perhaps I can reverse this from the same text of female that we include the exchange of unblemished animals as being offered. We include the exchange of blemished animals. He said to him, Am I asking you to reverse the interpretation of the expression if it be which is next to a male and the interpretation of the expression if it be which is next to a female? I mean this reverse the whole per se as follows: the expression a male includes the case of exchange and the expression a female includes a young. He replied to him, The word whale of the young has a masculine implication, whereas the word temur exchange has a Feminine implication for what practical purpose said Samuel in order to be offered and according to the opinion of our Eliezer for you might have thought that our Eliezer only holds that the young is regarded as a burnt offering because the name of a burnt offering is applied to its mother but these young of a blemished peace offering are not offered he therefore informs us that it is not so Barpata says in order that they be left to pasture and this is according to all the authorities. Concerned it was stated also Rabbah says in order to be offered and according to the opinion of our Eliezer our Papa says in order to be left to pasture and according to all the authorities concerned but the following tenet derives this from your scripture says only thy holy things this refers to exchanges which thou hast this refers to the young of dedications thou shalt take and go one might think from this text that he brings the offspring into the temple and refrains from giving them water. And food in order that they may die, the text therefore states, and thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings the flesh and the blood to teach us that you must deal with an exchange as you deal with the burnt offering, and that you must deal with the young of peace offerings and their exchange as you deal with the peace offerings themselves. One might think that the young and exchange even of all dedications are offered. The text, however, states rack only this is the teaching of our Ishmael or Akiva says. There is no need to derive the limitation from rack, for it says it is a guilt offering, implying it is offered, but its exchange is not offered. The master said, Thou shalt take and go one might think from this text that he brings the offspring into the temple, etc. But how could you have inferred the seeing that tradition mentions five sin offerings as left to die, thus implying that these are offered, you might have thought that the five sin offerings are left to die everywhere, whereas these are. Left to die only in the temple scripture therefore informs us that it is not so the master said one might think that the young and exchange of all dedications are offered the text however says rack only now to what young are we alluding here if to the young of a burnt offering it is a male and is not capable of giving birth if to the young of a sin offering there is a traditional law that it is condemned to die Talmud, Masti Mura if to a guilt offering there is a traditional law that it goes to pasture since according to tradition wherever a sin offering is left to die a guilt offering in a similar case goes to pasture one may still say that we are referring to a sin offering the traditional law however refers to its death whereas the scriptural text only refers to the restriction upon offering it but does not one depend on the other for since it is condemned to die then automatically it is not offered rather the traditional law refers to a sin offering and it Scriptural text rack excludes the exchange of a guilt offering from death but is not this too a traditional law for it is said wherever the law is that a sin offering is left to die a guilt offering is left to pasture rather the text rack is required for the case where he transgressed and offered making him guilty of breaking a positive command our Akiva says there is no need to derive the limitation from rack etc it is offered but its exchange is not offered what need is there for the text? Is there not a traditional law in this connection yes that is so then what need is there for the scriptural text it is required for our Arunas teaching for our Arunas said if an animal dedicated as a guilt offering has been condemned to pasture until it dies a natural death and the owner killed it without stating for what specific sacrifice it is fit for a burnt offering now our says which has been condemned to pasture but if it has not been condemned to pasture it would not be so what is it? Reason scripture says it, it remains in the same status and according to the Tana who derives the cases of the young of peace offerings etc. from these scriptural texts why not derive this from the text if it be a male or female the text is required to teach the cases of the young of blemished animals and the exchange of blemished animals but why not derive all these cases from this text the phrase if it be does not teach this according to him and the Tana who derives the teaching. Concerning the young and exchange of a peace offering etc. from the text if it be a male or female what does he do with the text thou shalt take and go even if you have to take them away from their pastures another version even if you have to take them away from their threshing sludges mission our Eliezer says the young of a peace offering must not be offered as a peace offering whereas the sages say it may be offered said our Simeon there is no dispute between them as regards the young of it. Young of a peace offering or the young of the young of an exchange that they are not offered. The point at issue is the case of the young of a peace offering. Our Eliezer saying it may not be offered, whereas the sages say it may be offered. Our Joshua and our Papias testified regarding the young of a peace offering that it is offered as a peace offering. Said our Papias, I testify that we had a cow of a peace offering and we ate it on Passover and we ate its young as a peace offering on the festival. Gemara RMI reported in the name of our Yohanan what is the reason of our Eliezer. Scripture says, and if we I'm his offering be a sacrifice of a peace offering and we interpret the I'm as M mother, thus excluding the young, said our high be Abba to our MI. If this is so, Scripture says, if I'm he offer it for a thanksgiving here too, shall we interpret the I'm as M, thus excluding the young, and if you say that it is so, has it not been taught once do we derive that its young its exchange and its substitution are all offered. The text states if I'm he offer it for a thanksgiving in any case rather said our high Abba in the name of our Yohanan this is the reason of our Eliza it is forbidden to be offered lest we were of them said our Simeon there is no dispute etc. It was asked how does the Mishnah mean there is no divergent opinion that they are not offered all agreeing that they are offered or perhaps there is no dispute that the second generation of offspring are offered all agreeing that they are not offered said Rabbi it is reasonable to suppose that the meaning of the Mishnah is there is no divergent opinion that they are not offered all agreeing that they are offered what is the reason our Eliza only disputes with the rabbis in the case of the young of a dedication but as regards the young of the young of a dedication it is a mere chance our Joshua B. Levi however says there is no divergent opinion that they are offered all agreeing that they are not offered what is the reason the rabbis do not differ from our Eliezer save in the case of the young of a dedication but in the case of the young of the young of a dedication one can recognize from his action that he means to rear them Talmud, Masti Mirabi Arhai taught in support of our Joshua B. Levi scripture says if he offer a lamb for his offering implying that the first young is offered but the second young is not offered it a young of a peace offering is offered but not the young of any other dedication now what young of other dedications is excluded from being offered if a burnt offering and a guilt offering are they not male animals and not such as give birth to young if of a sin offering is there not a traditional law that it is left to die said Rabbin the exclusion refers to a young of a female animal which came forth the tent what need is there for a text regarding the case of a young of an animal which came forth the tent is this not derived from an analogy between passing used in connection with tithe and
offered as a peace offering. Consequently, he testifies that it is offered Mishnah the young of a thanksgiving offering and its exchange their young and the young of their young until the end of all time are considered as thanksgiving offerings only. They do not require the accompaniment of loaves of bread. Tomorrow, whence is this proof? Our rabbis have taught why does it say if he offer it for a thanksgiving? Whence do we infer that if one set aside a thanksgiving offering and it became lost and he separated another in its place and the first was then found and both animals are standing before us, he can offer whichever he wishes and bring its bread? The text states if for a thanksgiving he shall offer one might think that the second animal requires the accompaniment of bread. The text, however, states if he offer it the word it implying that he brings one animal with the loaves of bread but not two. Whence do we include for offering the case of the young of a thanksgiving offering? Exchanges and substitutions. The text states if for a thanksgiving one might think that all these cases require the accompaniment of loaves of bread. The text states with a sacrifice of thanksgiving implying that the thanksgiving itself requires loaves of bread, but its young its exchange and its substitution do not require the bringing of bread. Mishnah the exchange of a burnt offering the young of its exchange its young and the young of its young until the end of time are regarded as a burnt offering. They require plain cutting into pieces and to be altogether burnt. If one set aside a female animal for a burnt offering and it gave birth to a male, it is to pasture until it becomes unfit for sacrifice. It is then sold and for its money he brings a burnt offering. Our Eliezer, however, says the male animal itself is offered as a burnt offering tomorrow. Why is it that in the first clause in our mission above the rabbis do not differ, whereas in the latter clause the rabbis do differ? Said. Rabbi Barhana, the first clause has been taught as a disputed opinion, being really the opinion of our Eliza. Rabbi says you can even say that the first clause is in agreement with the rabbis, for the rabbis dispute with our Eliza only in the case of one who sets apart a female animal for a burnt offering, since the mother is not offered for a burnt offering, but in the case of the young of an exchange of a burnt offering where the mother is offered, even the rabbis agree. But did our Eliza say that the young of an exchange is itself offered as a burnt offering? Against this, the following is quoted in contradiction the exchange of a guilt offering, the young of an exchange, their young and the young of their young until the end of time are to go to pasture until they are unfit for sacrifice, they are then sold and the monies are applied for free will. Dash offerings, our Eliezer says, let them die, our Eliza says, let him buy burnt offerings with their money. Now he only brings an offering. For their money, but he must not bring the animal itself as a burnt offering. Said our Hisdar Eliezer was arguing with the rabbis from their own premises as follows. As far as I am concerned, I hold that even the young itself of the exchange of a guilt offering is also offered as a burnt offering. But according to your teaching, when you say that it is not offered, at least admit that the surplus of sacrificial appropriations are applied to free will offerings of an individual. The rabbis, however, answer him the surpluses are applied to free will offerings on behalf of the congregation. Rabbi says our Eliezer holds that the young itself is offered for a burnt offering only in a case where one sets aside a female animal for a burnt offering because the mother has the name of a burnt offering. Talmud, Mosim Yura, but in the case of exchange of a guilt offering where the mother has not the name of a burnt offering, Eliezer also agrees that one can buy a burnt offering with. It's money, but that the animal itself is not offered. Have a raised an objection, but does our Eliza indeed require that the mother should have the name of a burnt offering? Has it not been taught if one sets aside a female animal for a Passover sacrifice, it is to pasture until unfit for sacrifice, it is then sold, and a Passover sacrifice a male is bought with its money if it gave birth before Passover, if the young is to pasture until it is unfit for sacrifice, it is then sold, and a Passover sacrifice is bought with its money if it remained over until after Passover, it is to pasture until it is unfit for sacrifice, it is then sold, and he brings a peace offering with its money if it the female Passover sacrifice gave birth, it is to pasture until it is unfit for sacrifice, it is then sold, and a peace offering is bought with its money. Our Eliza says the animal itself is offered as a peace offering. Now here is a case where the mother has not the name of a peace offering, and our Eliza Says he offers it as a peace offering. Rabbi said to him, the case after Passover is different since what has not been used of animals dedicated for the Passover sacrifice is itself offered as peace offerings. If this is so, let the dispute between our Eliza and the rabbis be stated also in connection with the first clause above. He said to him, yes, that is so. Abbe says our Eliza does not differ in the first clause above since there we have it on tradition that the purpose for which an unused dedicated animal goes its young is used in the same way now after Passover when an animal unused for a Passover sacrifice is considered a peace offering its young too is used as a peace offering but before Passover for what purpose did he dedicate the mother for the value of the Passover sacrifice therefore in the case of the young too it is used for the value of the Passover sacrifice our Bobby Hammer raised an objection but do we say that since the mother is used only for its money value? Its young is also used only for its money value. Surely it has been taught if one sets aside a female animal for the Passover sacrifice it and its offspring pasture until unfit for sacrifice and they are then sold and a the Passover sacrifice is bought with the money. Our Eliza, however, says the animal itself is offered as a Passover sacrifice. Now here the mother is dedicated for its value and our Eliza says that its young is offered as a Passover sacrifice and we do not apply to it the same rule as to its mother said Rabbanu. We are dealing here with a case where he sets aside a pregnant animal. Our Eliza holds the view of our Yohanan who says that if he left over the embryo for a different dedication the act is valid for an embryo is not considered as the thigh of its mother. Therefore it is only the mother being a female which receives no bodily consecration whereas its embryo receives bodily consecration said Marzitra the son of our Mari to Rabbanu. It also stands to reason that we are Dealing in the above Beritha with the case of a pregnant animal since the Beritha says it and its offspring this is proved Talmud, Mastim Yura Jose B. Hanada said our Eliza admits that where one sets aside a female animal for a guilt offering its young is not offered as a guilt offering but surely this is obvious for our Eliza refers only to a case where one sets aside a female animal for a burnt offering since its mother has the name of a burnt offering whereas where one sets aside a female for a guilt offering since the mother has not the name of a guilt offering even our Eliza agrees that it is not offered as a guilt offering if our Jose had not informed us of this I might have thought that the reason of our Eliza was not because the mother has the name of a burnt offering but because the young is fit for offering and this animal too is fit for offering our Jose therefore informs us that it is not so if this is so why does our Jose inform us that its young is not Offered as a guilt offering, why not rather inform us that its young is not offered as a burnt offering, and the same would apply to a guilt offering if our Jose had informed us concerning a burnt offering. I might have thought that the young is not offered as a burnt offering since the mother was not dedicated for that holiness, but in the case of a burnt offering, I might have said that the young is offered as a guilt offering. Our Jose therefore informs us that it is not so mission if one sets aside a female animal for a guilt offering, it must go to pasture until it becomes unfit for sacrifice, it is then sold, and he brings a guilt offering with its money. If however he has already offered his guilt offering, its value is put into the chest for free will offerings. Our Simeon, however, says it is sold without waiting for a blemish tomorrow, but why wait until the guilt offering becomes blemished? Let it be sold for since it is not fit for anything that in itself constitutes a blemish. Rab Judah reported in the name of Rab the reason is this because we say since consecration in respect of its value rests on it there also rests on it bodily consecration said Rabbi this proves that if one dedicates a male animal for its value it receives bodily consecration it has been stated if one dedicated a male animal for its value our Kahana says it receives the holiness of bodily consecration whereas Rabbi says it does not receive the holiness of bodily consecration Rabbi however withdrew his opinion in favor of that of our Kahana on account of the explanation given above by Rab Judah in the name of Rab Arsimian however says it is sold without waiting for a blemish said our high B Abin to our Yohanan but why do we not say that since there rests on the animal a consecration for value there also rests on it bodily consecration our Simeon follows the opinion expressed by him elsewhere where he says wherever an animal is not fit for offering a bodily consecration does not rest on if for it has been taught if a guilt offering which should be a
For his burnt offering affects exchange, but that which he sets aside for his Passover sacrifice or guilt offering cannot affect exchange, since there is no animal which can affect exchange except that which pastures until unfit for sacrifice. Said Rabbi, I do not approve of the opinion of our Simeon with reference to a Passover sacrifice, since unused money or animals dedicated for the Passover is offered as peace offerings. And why does he not say, I do not approve of the opinion of our Simeon in connection with a guilt offering, since an unused guilt offering is offered as a burnt offering? Rabbi holds the opinion of the rabbis who say the surpluses of sacrificial appropriation belong to the free will offerings of the congregation, and the congregation cannot affect exchange. Now it is assumed that the reason why our Simeon holds that a female set aside as a burnt offering can affect exchange is because a female has the name of burnt offering in the case of a poor man who brings a burnt. Offering of a bird according to this a cow set aside by a high priest for his sacrificial bullock should become holy and effect exchange since we have the case of the cow of sin offering the cow of sin offering is regarded as a dedication for temple repairs and a dedication for temple repairs cannot affect exchange then if an individual sets aside a goat instead of a she goat for his sin offering let it become holy since we find elsewhere the case of a ruler who sets aside a goat for a sin offering or again if a ruler sets aside a she goat instead of a goat as a sin offering let it become holy since elsewhere an individual sets aside a she goat for a sin offering these are two separate persons bodies but if he sinned before he was a ruler even if he set aside a goat in place of a she goat let it become holy and effect exchange since if he sinned now after his appointment he brings a goat here it is different for since he did not sin as a ruler he is not required to bring a goat if so here too he does not actually bring a burnt offering of a bird our Simeon holds the opinion of our Eliezer B. Ezra for we have learned if one says behold I take upon myself to bring a burnt offering he brings a sheep whereas our Eliezer B. Ezra says or a turtle dove or a pigeon we have learned elsewhere if one dedicates his property for temple repairs and there are animals among them fit for the altar i.e. unblemished males and females our Eliezer says the males shall be sold as burnt offerings and the females shall be sold as peace offerings and their money together with the rest of the property shall go for temple repairs our Joshua however says the males themselves are offered as burnt offerings the females are sold as peace offerings burnt offerings are bought with their money and the rest of the property is applied for temple repairs said our high B. Abba to our Yohanan according to the opinion of our Joshua who said that the males are themselves offered as burnt Offerings how can the females be offered as peace offerings seeing that their status is that of cancelled holiness another version said our high B. Abba to our Yohan and since our Joshua says the males are themselves offered as burnt offerings does this mean to say that he dedicated them in respect of bodily dedication if so why are the females sold for peace offerings do not the females require to pasture here Yohan and answered him our Joshua agrees with our Simeon who says anything which is not fit for offering is not subject to bodily dedication for we have learned our Simeon says it shall be sold without waiting for a blemish and we explained that the reason of our Simeon is that since the female animal is not fit for a guilt offering it is not subject to bodily dedication here too since a female animal is not fit for a burnt offering it is not subject to bodily dedication but does not our Simeon's teaching refer only to a case where one sets aside a female animal for a guilt offering Talmud, Mastim Yurubi since the mother has not the name of a guilt offering whereas in the case of a female set aside for a burnt offering where the mother has the name of a burnt offering even our Simeon agrees that it can receive dedication as such moreover we have heard from our Simeon that a female animal set aside for his burnt offering affects exchange here Yohanan replied to him our Joshua will agree with the other Tana who quotes our Simeon for it has been taught our Simeon be Judah. Reported in the name of our Simeon he cannot affect exchange with a female animal set aside even for his burnt offering mission of the exchange of a guilt offering the young of an exchange their young and the young of their young until the end of time must go to pasture until unfit for sacrifice they are then sold and their money is applied to a free will offering our Eliezer however says let them die while our Eliezer says let him bring burnt offerings with the money a guilt offering whose owner died. Or whose owner obtained atonement through another animal must go to pasture until unfit for sacrifice they are then sold and the money of the offering is applied to a free will offering our Eliezer however says let the animal die while our Eliezer says let him buy a burnt offering for the money but cannot a net of a free will offering also be a burnt offering what then is the difference between the opinion of our Eliezer and that of the sages only in that when the offering comes as an obligation he lays his hand on it and he brings drink offerings and the drink offerings must be provided by him and if he is a priest the privilege of officiating and its height belong to him whereas when he brings a free will offering he does not lay his hand on it he does not bring drink offerings with it the drink offerings are provided by the congregation and although he is a priest the privilege of officiating and its height belong to the men of the division officiating in that particular week tomorrow is necessary for the mission to mention that in both cases there is a difference of opinion for if we had been taught the case of a guilt offering whose owners had died or procured atonement through another animal we might have thought that their Eliezer says that they die because we prohibit after atonement in virtue of having prohibited before atonement but in the case of the exchange of a guilt offering or the young of an exchange I might have thought that he agrees with the rabbis. And if we had been taught the case of the exchange of a guilt offering I might have thought that the rabbis say there that the animal pastures but in the case of a guilt offering whose owners had died or obtained atonement I might have thought that they agree with our Eliezer it was therefore necessary for the mission to mention both cases are nomin reported in the name of Rabbi Abba the dispute applies only after atonement has taken place but before atonement all the authorities agree. That the young itself can be offered as a guilt offering said Rabbi there are two arguments against this opinion first that a man cannot obtain atonement with something which he obtained as the result of a transgression and moreover our Hanani learned in support of our Joshua B. Levi the first generation is offered but the second generation is not offered rather if the statement was made it was made in this form our nomin reported in the name of Rabbi Abba the dispute applies before atonement has taken place but after atonement has taken place all the authorities concerned agree that the animal itself is offered as a burnt offering but has not our Hanani learned a teaching in support of our Joshua B. Levi this remains a difficulty our Abin Bihai asked our Abin Bihai if one set aside a female animal for a guilt offering may its young be offered as a burnt offering but why not solve this from the teaching of our Joseph Bihana who said that our Eliza agreed here Abin Bihai never Heard this teaching, what is the ruling here? Abin Bikahana replied to him, Its young is offered as a burnt offering, but what answer is this? Our Eliezer only refers to the case of one who set aside a female for a burnt offering where the mother has the name of a burnt offering, but in the case of a guilt offering where the mother has not the name of a burnt offering, even our Eliezer agrees here. Abin Bikahana replied to him, The reason of our Eliezer is not because its mother has the name of a burnt offering, but because it the young is fit for offering, and here too the young is fit for offering. He raised an objection, their young and the young of their young until the end of time, etc. Our Eliezer says, Let him bring a burnt offering with their money. Now he brings a burnt offering with their money. Talmud, Mastimura implying, but he must not offer the animal itself as a burnt offering. We are dealing here with a case where e.g. at the exchange gave birth to a female animal and until the end of time would it not give birth even to one male he said to him I am giving you a forced answer of a Babylonian character where e.g. it gave birth until the end of time to females only but what answer could he have given him the reason there why our Eliezer says that only the money can be used for a burnt offering is because he may come to make a substitution mission of the exchange of the firstling and an animal tithe their young and the young of their young until the end of time these have the law of the firstling and an animal tithe and are eaten by the owners when blemished what is the difference between a firstling and an animal tithe on the one hand and other dedications on the other all blemished dedications are sold in the market killed in the market and weighed by the pound but not a firstling and an animal tithe the other dedications and their exchanges are redeemed but not a firstling and an animal tithe the other dedications come from outside the holy Lent to the Holy Land, but not a firstling and an animal tithe. If they, however, came from outside the Holy Land unblemished, they are offered. If blemished, they are eaten by their owners with their blemishes. Said our Simeon
Divine law excludes these cases by means of the text they are wholly implying that they are offered but their exchange is not offered similarly the case of the ninth animal of the tent is also excluded by the divine law saying the tent thus excluding the ninth animal if they however came unblemished etc the following contradicts this the son of Antigonus brought up firstlings from Babylon to the holy land and they were not accepted from him to be offered said Arhistah there is no difficulty this is the opinion of our Ishmael and that is the opinion of our Akiba for it has been taught our Jose reported three things in the name of three elders our Ishmael says one might say that a man can bring up second tithe and eat it in Jerusalem nowadays now we may argue thus a firstling requires bringing to the holy place and second tithe requires bringing to the holy place just as a firstling is not eaten except when there is a temple in existence so second tithe should not be eaten. Except when there is a temple in existence, no, if you can say this of the firstling which requires the application of blood to and the burning of sacrificial portions on the altar, shall you say the same of second tithe which does not require this, then you may reason thus first fruits require bringing to the holy place and second tithe requires bringing to the holy place just as first fruits are not eaten except when the temple is in existence. Similarly, second tithe should not be eaten except when the temple is in existence. I can, however, reply, you can argue so of first fruits which require setting before the altar, but will you say the same of second tithe which does not require this? The text therefore states, Thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God the tithe of thy corn and of thy wine and of thy oil and the firstlings of thine herds and of thy flocks. It thus compares second tithe with the firstling just as a firstling is not eaten except when the temple is in existence, so second. Tithe is not eaten except when the temple is in existence, but why not go around with the argument and prove the case of second tithe by analogy from the common point said Arashi because one can object as to the point firstling and first fruits share in common it is that they both require the altar now what is our Ishmael's view does he hold that with the first consecration he Joshua consecrated the land for the time being as long as it was inhabited by Israel and also for the future then. There should be no difference between firstling and second tithe both being suitable to be brought and if our Ishmael holds that with the first consecration he Joshua consecrated for the time being but not for the future why not raise the question even concerning a firstling one can maintain that our Ishmael holds that with the first consecration he Joshua consecrated the land for the time being but not for the future but here he is thinking of a case where e.g. the blood of the firstling was sprinkled while the temple was still in existence and the temple was then destroyed and the flesh of the firstling still remained since therefore if the blood was in existence it would not be fit to be sprinkled we therefore derive the case of the flesh of the firstling from the case of the blood of the firstling Talmud, Mosti Mirabi and then we derive the case of second tithe from the case of firstling but do we infer one case of dedication from another has not our Yohanan said. Throughout the Torah we can derive by inference one rule from another which has itself been derived by inference save only in the field of dedications where we do not derive a rule from one which is itself derived tithe of grain is considered hull and this explanation will suffice for one who holds that that which is derived is the deciding factor but what answer would you give according to the authority who holds that that from which it is derived is the deciding factor flesh and blood in. The case of firstling are considered one subject. Our Akiva says one might think that a man can bring up the firstling from outside the holy land to the holy land when the temple is standing and offer it. The text, however, states, And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God the tithe of thy corn and of thy wine and of thy oil and the firstlings of thy herds and of thy flocks, thus implying that you may bring up the firstling to the holy land from the same place from where second tithe of grain is brought up, and that you cannot bring up the firstling to the holy land from the place from which you cannot bring up second tithe of grain. Ben Aze says one might say that a man may bring up the second tithe and eat it wherever he can see Jerusalem. One may argue as follows a firstling requires bringing to a holy place, and second tithe requires bringing to a holy place, just as a firstling is not eaten except within the wall of Jerusalem, so second tithe is not eaten except within. The wall of Jerusalem to this I can reply how can you argue from a firstling which requires the application of blood to and the burning of sacrificial portions on the altar to second tithe which does not require the scripture therefore says thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God the tithe of thy corn and of thy wine and of thy oil and the firstlings of etc. Thus comparing second tithe with firstling as follows just as a firstling is not eaten except within the wall of Jerusalem. Similarly second tithe is not eaten except within the wall of Jerusalem but what is Benazay's difficulty that he should say one might think etc. I will tell you since we have learned the difference between Shiloh and Jerusalem consists in this that in Shiloh one may eat minor dedications and second tithe wherever one can see it whereas in Jerusalem he may do so only within the wall and in both dedications of the higher degree of holiness are eaten inside the enclosures of the temple. Court, you might think that the second tithe should be eaten wherever one can see Jerusalem. Ben Aze needs therefore to quote a text to inform us that it is not so. Others say one might think that a firstling whose year is past has the same law as disqualified dedications and should be disqualified. Scripture, however, says the tithe of thy corn of thy wine and of thy oil. Thus, comparing firstling with second tithe as follows: just as second tithe is not disqualified from one year to another, so a firstling which is left over from one year to another is not disqualified. And the rabbis who interpreted the text above for another purpose, whence do they derive that one may bring a firstling left over from the first year to the other? They derive this from the scriptural text: Thou shalt eat it before the Lord thy God year by year, which teaches us that a firstling left over from one year to another is not disqualified. And how do the others interpret the text? Thou shalt eat. It before the Lord thy God year by year they need this text for what has been taught one day from this year and a day from the next this teaches us that a firstling may be eaten for two days and a night and whence do the rabbis derive that a firstling may be eaten for two days and a night the text says it shall be to thee as the breast of the waving chapteriv mission of the young of a sin offering the exchange of a sin offering and a sin offering whose owner has died or left to die sin offering whose year is past or which was lost and found blemished if the owners obtained atonement afterwards through another animal is left to die it does not affect exchange Talmud Masti Mira it is forbidden rabbinic ally to derive benefit from it but the law of sacrilege does not apply to it if however the owners have not yet obtained atonement it must go to pasture until it becomes unfit for sacrifice it is then sold immediately and another is bought with the money it affects. Exchange and the law of sacrilege applies to it. Gemara, why does not the mission state them the five sin offerings which are left to die altogether? The Tana is sure of the three cases in the first part of the mission, but is not sure of the two other cases in the latter part of the mission. What need is there to state this whole mission in tractate Mila and here in Temur? The Tana in the mission states here the rule of exchange with reference to the five sin offerings. And since he states the rule of exchange here, he also states the rule of sacrilege. And since he states the law of sacrilege in Temur, he also states in Mila the law of exchange. Said Reshlekish, a sin offering whose year is past is regarded as if it stood in a cemetery and it is left to pasture. We have learned, and one whose year is past and which was lost and found blemished, if the owners obtained atonement afterwards through another animal is left to die, shall we say this refutes? Reshlakish Reshlakish can answer you the first part of the mission refers to the case where the sin offering was lost and found blemished if so read the latter part of the mission if however the owners have not yet obtained atonement it must go to pasture until unfit for sacrifice now if the mission refers to a blemished animal is it not already unfit said rather the mission should read as follows or it was lost and found blemished with a transitory blemish if after the owners have obtained atonement it is condemned to die if however before the owners have obtained atonement let it go to pasture until unfit for sacrifice with a permanent blemish and then sold said rather there are two arguments against this answer first if so the mission ought to have said let him keep it the animal with the transitory blemish and moreover for what purpose does the mission mention a sin offering whose year is passed rather therefore said this is meant by the mission if the sin offering Past its year and was lost or if it was lost and found blemished if after the owners have obtained atonement through another animal it is left to die if before the owners have obtained atonement let it go to pasture until unfit for sacrifice and then be sold and there is need to mention the condition of its being lost both in connection with the blemished sin offering and where a sin offering passed its year for if it mentioned the condition of
Fit to offer either itself or its value, whereas here granted that it is not itself fit for offering, its value is fit for offering. We have learned elsewhere the second goat goes to pasture until unfit for sacrifice and it is then sold and its money is devoted to the purchase of a free will offering. Since a congregational sin offering is not condemned to die, this implies that in the case of an individual sin offering it is condemned to die and are Yohanan explained animals dedicated for sacrifices are removed forever from sacred use and the atonement is through the second animal of the second peer. Now the first goat of the first peer is like the case of a sin offering whose year is past. The reason therefore why it is not condemned to die is because it is a congregational offering, but if it were an individual offering it would be condemned to die. Rabbi can answer you the case where animals are removed from sacred use is one thing and the case of an animal which was lost is another. What is the reason if sin offerings were lost his mind is on them in case they may be found whereas where the sin offerings are removed from sacred use they can never be fit again for offering Talmud. Mas Tinurabi the text says above Rabbi said a sin offering which had been lost at night has not the name legally of a lost sin offering in accordance with whom is this opinion shall I say according to the rabbis if so why does Rabbi mention the condition of being lost at night the same? Applies even if it were lost by day since the rabbis say that a lost sin offering found when the animal set aside in its place had not yet been offered is condemned to pasture rather it is according to the opinion of rabbi for rabbi holds that rabbi's ruling only applies to a sin offering which was lost by day but with regard to a sin offering which was lost by night even rabbi agrees that it goes to pasture or if you prefer another solution I may say one may still hold that it is. According to the opinion of the rabbis and we are supposing here that the sin offering was lost and was only found when the owners obtained atonement the opinion of the rabbis that a sin offering which was lost when the owners obtained atonement is condemned to die only applying when the loss first occurred by day but where the loss first occurred by night it is not so said we have a tradition lost but not stolen lost but not robbed how is the case of a sin offering which was lost to be. Understood said Arashai it means even a single animal which became mixed up with his herd and even one which became mixed up with another Ar Yohanan says if the sin offering ran behind the door the question was asked what is meant by Ar Yohanan's view shall we say that the law of a lost sin offering only applies where the sin offering is behind the door since no one can see the animal but if the sin offering ran outside into the wilderness since there are others who can see it, it has not the law of a lost sin offering or perhaps a sin offering behind the door though if the owner turns his face he can see it as yet the law of a lost sin offering then all the more so is this the case with a sin offering which ran outside where he does not see it at all let it stand undecided said our papa we have a tradition if the sin offering has been lost to the owner but not to the shepherd it has not the law of a lost sin offering and this is certainly the case where the Sin offering has been lost to the shepherd but not to the owner how is it if the sin offering has been lost to him the owner and to the shepherd but one from quite another place recognized it let it stand undecided our papa asked how is it if the sin offering was lost when the blood of its companion was in the cup to whom is this question addressed shall I say to rabbi but does he not hold that a lost sin offering found when the animal set aside in its place had not yet been offered is condemned to die rather his our papa's inquiry will be addressed to the rabbis as follows do we say that the ruling of the rabbis that a lost sin offering found when the animal set aside in its place had not yet been offered is condemned to pasture only applies before the blood was received in the cup but here they hold that whatever is ready to be sprinkled is considered as if it had been sprinkled and therefore it is condemned to die or perhaps that so long as the blood has not yet been sprinkled it is like the case where a lost sin offering was found when the animal set aside in its place had not yet been offered and it is condemned to pasture some there are who say one might indeed say that our papa's inquiry is addressed to rabbi and his inquiry will be where e.g. he received the blood in two cups and one of them was lost and according to the authority who holds that one cup removes the other cups of blood from sacred use the question cannot arise it can arise however according to the authority who holds that one cup of blood renders the blood in the other cups remainder do we say that this only applies where both cups are present since he can sprinkle whichever cup he wishes but here it was lost or perhaps there is no difference let it remain undecided mission if one set aside a sin offering and it was lost and he offered another instead of it if then the first animal i has found it is left to die if one set aside money for his Sin offering and it was lost and he offered a sin offering instead of it if then the money was found it goes to the dead sea if one set aside money for his sin offering and it was lost and he set aside other money instead of it if he did not have the opportunity of purchasing a sin offering with it until the first money was found he brings a sin offering from both sums and the rest of the money is used for a free will offering if one set aside money for his sin offering and it was lost and he set aside a sin offering instead of it if he did not have the opportunity of offering it until the money was found and the sin offering was blemished it is sold and he brings a sin offering from both sums and the rest is used as a free will offering if one set aside a sin offering and it was lost and he set aside money instead of it if he did not have the opportunity of purchasing a sin offering until his sin offering was found in a blemished state it is sold and he brings a sin offering from both sums and the rest is used for a free will offering if one set aside a sin offering and it was lost and he set aside another sin offering instead of it if he did not have the opportunity to offer it until the first sin offering was found and both were blemished they are to be sold and he brings a sin offering from both sums and the rest is used for a free will offering if one set aside a sin offering and it was lost and he set aside another instead of it if he did not have the opportunity of offering it until the first sin offering was found and both animals were unblemished one of them is offered as a sin offering and the second is condemned to die this is the teaching of rabbi the sages however say the law of a sin offering which is condemned to die only applies where it is found after the owners obtained atonement and the money does not go to the dead sea except where found after the owners have obtained atonement if one set aside a sin offering and it is Blemished he sells it and purchases another for its money. Our Eliezer son of Arsimian says if the second animal was offered before the first was killed it is condemned to die since the owners have already obtained atonement tomorrow. The reason why the sin offering is condemned to die is because the other sin offering was offered instead of it. But if the other sin offering was not offered instead of it it is only condemned to pasture whose opinion does this represent it is that of the rabbis. Who hold that a lost sin offering found when the animal set aside instead of it had not yet been offered is condemned to pasture then read the subsequent clause of the Mishnah. If one set aside money for a sin offering and it became lost and he set aside other money instead of it if he did not have the opportunity of purchasing a sin offering with it he brings a sin offering with both sums and the rest is used for a free will offering now the reason is because he brings a sin offering. From both sums, but if he brought a sin offering from one of the sums of monies, the second is taken to the Dead Sea, and this will be the opinion of Rabbi who says that a lost sin offering found when the animal set aside in its place had not yet been offered is condemned to die. The first part of the Mishnah will thus be the opinion of the Rabbis, and the latter part that of Rabbi. Now there is no difficulty according to our Hunaf or our Huna reported in the name of Rab Talmud, Mastimura. All the authorities agree that if he selected one on his own accord and offered it, the second sin offering dies. The latter part of the Mishnah here can therefore be explained as referring to a case where e.g. he deliberately selected one heap of the monies for a sin offering and offered it, and the Mishnah will thus be according to all the authorities concerned, even the Rabbis, but according to our Abba who reported Rabbi saying all the authorities concerned agree that where the Owner obtained atonement through the sin offering which was not lost the lost sin offering is condemned to die and the difference of opinion arises only where the owner obtained atonement through the lost sin offering rabbi holding that the sin offering set aside instead of the lost one has the same law as the lost sin offering whereas the rabbis hold that it has not the same law as the lost sin offering are we to say that the tenor of the early part of the mission states the law anonymously in agreement with the rabbis and in the latter part of the mission it states the law anonymously according to rabbi yes the first part of the mission agrees with the opinion of the rabbis and the latter part agrees with the opinion of rabbi now what does the tenor of the mission inform us that rabbi and the rabbis differ surely the mission explicitly mentions later this difference of opinion between rabbi and the rabbis as follows if one set aside a sin offering and it was lost
Eat hollen and terima with it in order that it may make a satisfying meal. What is the point of the expression they shall eat it in order to teach us that if the quantity was large, the priests must not eat hollen or terima with it in order that the meal offering should not make an overstated meal is not this barita, even according to the opinion of Rabbi. No, it is according to the rabbis, but our Abba reported in the name of Rabbi. All the authorities concerned agree that where the owners obtained atonement through the sin offering which was never lost, the lost sin offering is condemned to die. The dispute between them, however, is where the owner obtained atonement through the sin offering which was lost. Rabbi holding that the sin offering set aside instead of the lost sin offering has the law of the lost sin offering, whereas the rabbis hold that it has not the law of the lost sin offering. We have learned the second goat pastures until unfit for sacrifice it is then sold and its money is. Used for a free will offering since a congregational sin offering is not condemned to die now this implies that a sin offering belonging to an individual is condemned to die and rap said animals destined for sacrifice are not removed from sacred use and consequently when he procures atonement he does so through the second goat of the first peer now this latter peer is like that which is set aside instead of a lost sin offering and yet the reason is because the goat belongs to the congregation but if it belonged to an individual it would be condemned to die Talmud, Mas Timurabi does not this mission represent even the opinion of the rabbis no it represents that of rabbi we have learned if one set aside a sin offering and it was lost and he offered another instead of it it is condemned to die now the reason is because he offered it and afterwards the first sin offering was found but if he did not offer it before the first animal was found it pastures irrespective of whether the atonement then took place through the lost sin offering or atonement took place through the sin offering which was never lost and irrespective of whether he selected one of the sin offerings or did not select shall we say that this refutes both Amorah and Matana and the Mishnah states what he is certain about but does not state what he is not certain about we have learned if one set aside money for a sin offering and it was lost and he set aside other money instead of it if the first money was then found he brings a sin offering from both sums and the rest is used for a free will offering now the reason is because the owner obtains atonement from a sin offering brought from both sums but if he brought a sin offering from one sum he takes the other to the dead sea irrespective of whether atonement took place through the lost money or the money which was never lost and irrespective of whether he selected one heap of the money or he did not select shall we Say this refutes the two Amram here to the Tana of the Mishnah states what he is certain about but he does not state what he is not certain about said RMI if one sets aside two heaps of money for security's sake he can obtain atonement for one of them and the other is then used for a free will offering whose opinion does this represent will you say the opinion of Rabbi surely it is obvious that the second heap of money is used for a free will offering since Rabbi says the money must go to the Dead Sea only in the case where one sets aside money for what is lost but he would agree that when the setting aside is for security's sake it must be used for a free will offering shall I say then that it is the opinion of the Rabbis but surely it is obvious that the monies are used for free will offerings it is a conclusion from minor to major as follows seeing that if one sets aside money instead of the money for a lost sin offering the Rabbis hold that it is not the law of the lost sin offering can there be a doubt where the setting aside is for security's sake rather he had to state it according to the opinion of our simian you might have said that our simian does not hold that there can be a free will offering of an animal which was once a sin offering rmi therefore informs us that a free will offering can take the place of a sin offering but how can you say that our simian holds that there is no free will offering in place of a sin offering have we not learned there were 13 horn shaped offering boxes in the temple and on them were inscribed respectively the words new shekels old shekels bird sacrifices pigeons for a burnt offering wood frankincense gold for kapurath and six horn shaped offering boxes were for the free will offerings of the congregation and it has been taught with reference to this mission of the statement six boxes for a free will offering means for burnt offerings which come from the sacrificial surpluses and it Skins do not belong to the priests. This is the teaching of our Judah. Our Nehemiah. Some say our Simeon said to him, If so, the interpretation of Jehoiada the priest is nullified since we have learned the following exposition was made by Jehoiada the priest. Scripture says it is a guilt offering. He is certainly guilty before the Lord. This includes everything which comes from the surpluses of sin offerings and guilt offerings, thus enjoining that burnt offerings shall be brought with their money. The flesh to be used for the name of God and the skins for the priests. Consequently, we see that our Simeon holds that there can be a free will offering replacing a sin offering. It is necessary for our Amai to give us his ruling in connection with our Simeon. For you might think that our Simeon holds that there can be a free will offering only in one row Talmud, Mas Timura, but in two rows it is not so. Our Amai therefore informs us that it is not so said. Our Hashai, if one sets aside two sin offerings. For security's sake he obtains atonement through either of them and its companion is left to pasture now whose opinion does this represent shall I say that of the rabbis surely if where one sets aside a sin offering for one which was lost the rabbis hold it has not the law of a lost sin offering is there then a question as regards the case of one setting aside a sin offering for security's sake then it is the opinion of our simian but has not our simian said five sin offerings are left to die. Rather it must be the opinion of rabbi for the ruling of rabbi only applies where a sin offering is set aside for one lost but where the setting aside is for security's sake the case is not so we have learned if one set aside a sin offering and it is blemished he sells it and brings another instead of it whereas our Eliezer son of our simian says if he offered the second animal before the first was killed for Hellenite he is condemned to die since the owners have already obtained atonement now it is to be assumed that our Eliezer son of our Simeon agrees with the opinion of Rabbi which proves that Rabbi's ruling applies even in the case of the setting aside for security's sake no perhaps our Eliezer son of our Simeon agrees with his father who says that the five sin offerings are condemned to die we have learned because a congregational sin offering is not condemned to die now this implies that a sin offering belonging to an individual in similar circumstances is left to die in Rab. Explained animals destined for sacrifice are not removed from sacred use and when he procures atonement he does so through the second goat of the first peer now the second goat of the second peer is a case of something being set aside for security's sake and yet as implied in this mission a sin offering belonging to an individual is left to die Rab follows the opinion expressed elsewhere where he said it is a proper performance of the duty to use the first Arshai Bizuri recited. Before our Papa, if a sin offering was still lost when another was set aside in its place according to Rabbi, the sin offering found before atonement is left to die, whereas according to the Rabbis it is left to pasture. If a sin offering was still lost when atonement was obtained by the owners according to the Rabbis it is left to die, whereas according to Rabbi it is left to pasture. He or Papa said to him, But can we not draw a conclusion from minor to major if in the case where a sin offering is still lost when another is set aside in its place where the Rabbis say it is left to pasture, Rabbi says that it is left to die. How much more so is this the case of a sin offering which is still lost when atonement has been obtained, where according to the Rabbis it is left to die, that according to Rabbi it is left to die, rather recite the passage, thus if a sin offering is still lost when another is set aside in its place according to Rabbi the animal is left to die, whereas According to the rabbis it pastures if a sin offering was still lost however when atonement was obtained it is the opinion of all the authorities concerned that it is condemned to die our Eliezer son of our Simeon said etc our rabbis have taught we must not flay an animal from the feet on holy days likewise we must not flay from the feet a firstling or dedications unfit for sacrifice even on a weekday now there is no difficulty in understanding why this is forbidden on a holy day it is because he takes excessive trouble in preparing something which is not suitable for him on that day but who is the Tana who holds that this is forbidden with reference to a firstling said Aristotle it is Beth Shammai who say that a firstling retains its holiness for we have learned Beth Shammai say one must not include an Israelite with a priest in connection with the eating of a firstling who is the Tana who forbids this in the case of dedications which became unfit for sacrifice said our his daughter Eliezer son of our Simeon for it has been taught if there were two sin offerings before the owner one unblemished and the other blemished the unblemished sin offering is offered and the blemished sin offering is redeemed if the blemished one was killed before the blood of the unblemished sin offering was sprinkled it is permitted to be eaten if after the blood of the unblemished sin
Permit him to sell them in the market, he will increase the redemption money in order to sell them later at a higher price. So here also, if you permit him to play the first link from the feet, he will increase the redemption money. Said Armari, the son of Kahana, the improvement in the value of the skin spoils the flesh. It was said in Palestine in the name of Arabin because it appears as if he performed work with dedications. Arhose B. Abin said it is forbidden lest he rear many herds of dedications rendered unfit for sacrifice. Talmud, Masti Mira B. C. H. A. P. T. E. R. B. Mishnah. What device do we use with reference to a first link? He says in respect of a pregnant animal which was giving birth for the first time. If what is in the inside of this animal is a male, let it be a burnt offering. If it then gave birth to a male, it is offered as a burnt offering. If he said if it is a female, let it be a peace offering. And if it gave birth to a female, it is offered as a peace offering. If he said if it is a male let it be a burnt offering and if a female let it be a peace offering and if it gave birth to a male and a female the male is offered as a burnt offering and the female is offered as a peace offering if it gave birth to two males one of them shall be offered as a burnt offering and the second shall be sold to persons under obligation to bring a burnt offering and its money becomes hollow if it gave birth to two females one of them is offered as a peace offering and the second is sold to persons under obligation to bring peace offerings and the money becomes hollow if the animal gave birth to a tumtum and a hermaphrodite or simian Gamaliel says no holiness attaches to them Gamar said Rab Judah one is permitted to make a blemish in a firstling before it is born we learned what device do we use with reference to a firstling he says in respect of a pregnant animal which was giving birth for the first time if what is in the inside of this animal is a Male, let it be a burnt offering. Now, this implies only a burnt offering, but not a peace offering. And yet, you say that he is able to release it altogether from its holiness. Rab Judah can answer you. Thus, the Tana of the Mishnah refers to the period when the temple stood. Whereas I refer to nowadays when a firstling is not fit to be offered. But if your ruling applies to nowadays, what need is there to teach it? You might have said that we should prohibit in case the greater part of the head goes forth, and he then makes a blemish in it. But why not say that it is so? Even so, this is better since otherwise he may come to shear and work the animal. If he said if it is a female, let it be a peace offering. But is a female animal sacred in respect of the law of the firstling? The latter clause of the Mishnah refers to a dedicated animal. If it gave birth to two males, etc., it was asked if the reference is to a dedicated animal. Then let the young which was dedicated as a burnt offering be. A burnt offering and the other young one born retain the holiness of its mother. This latter clause refers to an animal of Hullan if it gave birth to a tumtum or a hermaphrodite, etc. Talmud, Masti Mure or Simeon B. Gamaliel holds the offspring of dedications become holy at birth. For if we were to think that they are holy from the time of their existence inside their mother, why should not holiness attach to them tumtum, etc. since they receive the holiness of their mother? But in fact this proves that the offspring of dedications become holy at birth. And the following Tana holds that the offspring of dedications are holy from the time of their existence in the inside of their mother. For our rabbis have taught if it had been said only a firstling shall not sanctify, I might have thought that a firstborn of man must not make dedications. The text therefore adds no man shall sanctify it, implying that at the firstling animal he must not sanctify for another dedication, but a Firstborn of man may make dedications, but I might still have said that he a firstborn must not sanctify a firstling for another dedication, but others may do so. The text therefore states among the beasts, saying, In effect, my concern is with the beast. One might think that he cannot sanctify it the firstling, even while it is in the inside of the animal for another dedication. The text therefore states as a firstling to the Lord, implying when it becomes a firstling to the Lord, you must not sanctify it for another dedication, but you may sanctify the firstling for another dedication while it is in the inside of the animal. One might have thought that the same applies to the young of all dedications. The text therefore states, Howbeit, thus intimating a division. Consequently, we see that this tana holds that the young of dedicated animals are holy from the time that they commence to exist in the inside of their mother. Said Aram Rome to Arshis, hate if one says of a firstling at the moment that the greater part of it was emerging from the womb, let it be a burnt offering. Is it a burnt offering or a legal firstling? Is it a burnt offering since every portion which came forth from the womb is wholly burnt on the altar, or is it a legal firstling as every portion which came forth from the womb retains its original sanctity? Another version is the firstling a burnt offering since this is a stringent holiness and therefore has effect on it, or is it a legal firstling? Since its holiness commences from the womb, he said to him, Why do you inquire? Is this not identical with the inquiry of Elphi as follows? If one says in connection with Leket, when the greater part of the produce has been plucked, let it be Hefker. Is it Leket or is it free? Is it Leket since its holiness is derived from heaven, or is it ownerless since poor and rich acquire possession thereof? And Abbe explained, What is this query whose word do we obey that of the divine master or of the people? Similarly here also whose word do we obey Mishnah if one says the young of this pregnant animal shall be a burnt offering and if the animal itself shall be a peace offering his words stand but if he says first it the animal shall be a peace offering and then and its young shall be a burnt offering its young is regarded as the young of a peace offering this is the teaching of our Meir Jose says if he intended to say this at first since it is impossible to mention both kinds of sacrifices simultaneously his words stand but if after he already said intentionally this shall be a peace offering he changes his mind and says its young shall be a burnt offering its young is regarded as the young of a peace offering Gamara said are Yohanan if one set aside a pregnant sin offering and it gave birth if he wishes he can obtain atonement through it the animal itself and if he wishes he can obtain atonement through its young what is the reason are Yohanan holds that if he Left over the young, the act is valid and an embryo is not regarded as part of the thigh of its mother. The case, therefore, is like one who sets aside two sin offerings for security's sake, where if he wishes he can obtain atonement through it, the one animal, and if he wishes through the other, our Eliezer raised an objection. It shall be a peace offering, and its young shall be a burnt offering. Its young is regarded as the young of a peace offering. Now, if we assume that if he left over the young, the act is valid, why does it say its young is regarded as the young of a peace offering? Should it not say its young is a peace offering? Said Artabla, ask no question from this mission, since Rab said to the Tanner, recite as follows Its young is a peace offering. An objection was raised if one says to his pregnant bond woman, Be thou a slave, but thy child shall be free. If she was pregnant, she obtains freedom in his behalf. Now, this creates no difficulty if you hold that if one left over the Young, the action is not valid, and that an embryo is considered as the thigh of its mother. For this reason, she obtains freedom in his behalf, since it is on a par with the case of one who freed a half of his slave. And this will represent the opinion of Rabbi, as it has been been taught. Talmud, Masti Murabi. If one frees a half of his slave, he goes out free, since his letter of manumission and his right of possession come simultaneously. But if you hold that if one left over the young, the act is valid, and that an embryo is not considered as the thigh of its mother, why then does she, the bond woman, obtain freedom in behalf of her child? Has it not been taught? We approve the teaching that a slave can obtain a letter of manumission for his fellow slave from the hand of one who is not his master, but not from the hand of one who is his master. You can therefore deduce from this that if one left over the young, the act is not valid. Shall we say this refutes our Yohanan's ruling above? It is. A refutation must it be said that the opinion whether if one left over the young the act is valid is a point at issue between Tanaim for it has been taught if one says to his pregnant bond woman be thou free but thy child shall be a slave the child acquires her status and is free this is the teaching of our Jose the Galilean whereas the sages say his words stand because it says the wife and her children shall be her masters but how is the scriptural text interpreted in support of the rabbis? Said Rabbi the text is just in support of the opinion of our Jose the Galilean who states that the child follows her status since it says the wife and her children shall be her masters implying that as long as the wife belongs to her master the child is her masters but if the wife does not belong to her master the child is not her masters now does this not mean that these Tanaim differ in this that our Jose the Galilean holds that if one left over the young the act is not valid whereas the rabbis hold that the act is valid. Our Yohanan can answer you. All the authorities concerned hold that if one left over the young, the act is valid. And the reason here is because
that the reason of Aryohanan is because if one left over the young the act is valid perhaps the reason of Aryohanan really is that a man can obtain atonement with the increment of dedicated animal said Arham and Aralaz or a pupil of Aryohanan was in the presence of Aryohanan and he Aryohanan did not give him that answer and yet you say that the reason of the ruling of Aryohanan is because a man can obtain atonement with the increment of dedications but if after he had already said intentionally this shall be a peace offering and he changed his mind etc surely this is obvious that its young is regarded as the offspring of a peace offering for can he change his mind whenever he wishes said our papa this clause is required only for the case where one statement followed the other in the same breath you might have said that two statements following each other immediately are considered as one statement and that this man was really reflecting aloud the mission therefore teaches us that it is not so mission if one says behold this animal of Helen shall be the exchange of a burnt offering the exchange of a peace offering it is the exchange of a burnt offering this is the teaching of our Mayor our Jose says if he originally intended this since it is impossible to mention both names of sacrifices simultaneously his words stand but if after he had already said this shall be an exchange of a burnt offering he changed his mind and said an exchange of a peace Offering it is the exchange of a burnt offering Talmud, Mosti Mura Gemara or Isaac the son of Joseph reported in the name of Aryohan and all the authorities concerned agree that if one says let this take effect and afterwards let this take effect it is the opinion of all that we hold to the first statement if he says let not this take effect unless this other takes effect all agree that both are holy the dispute however is only e.g. in the case stated by the mission of the exchange of a burnt offering the exchange of a peace offering are mayor holding that since he ought to have said the exchange of a burnt offering and a peace offering and he said the exchange of a burnt offering the exchange of a peace offering it is like the case of one who says let this take effect and afterwards let this take effect our Jose however holds the man thinks that if he said the exchange of a burnt offering and a peace offering the result would be that it is holy but is not offered our Jose therefore informs us that his words stand our rabbis have taught if one says this animal shall be half the exchange of a burnt offering and the other half the exchange of a peace offering the whole animal is offered as a burnt offering this is the teaching of our Meir the sages however say let it pasture until it becomes blemished it is then sold and with the half of its money an exchange of a burnt offering is purchased and with the other half of its money an exchange of a peace offering our Jose says if he originally intended this since it is impossible to mention both names of sacrifices simultaneously his words stand but is not the opinion of our Jose identical with that of the rabbis the whole of the first part of this beretha is taught by our Jose another beretha taught an animal half of which is a burnt offering and the other half of sin offering is offered as a burnt offering this is the teaching of our Meir our Jose says let it die and both these ten hold alike that if one says First a half of the animal shall be a sin offering and then the other half shall be a burnt offering the animal is condemned to die you say they hold alike now whose opinion does this mean to represent that of Armeir but surely this is obvious you might have said that if we had not been informed of this I might have thought that the reason of Armeir is not because of the rule hold to the first statement but the reason really is because a sin offering which has been mixed up with another dedication is offered and therefore even if he said first a half of the animal shall be a sin offering and then a half shall be a burnt offering it is offered the beretha therefore informs us that it is not so another beretha taught if one says half of this animal shall be a burnt offering and the other half shall be a peace offering it is holy but is not offered it the animal affects exchange and its exchange has the same status now whose opinion does this beretha Represent that of our Jose surely it is obvious that the animal is holy but is not offered the beretha requires to mention the case of its exchange for you might have said granted that the animal itself is not offered still its exchange is offered the beretha therefore informs us as follows why is the case of the animal itself different so that it is not offered because of suspended holiness its exchange also is such in virtue of a suspended holiness or Yohanan said if an animal belonged to two partners and one dedicated his half and then proceeded to purchase the other half and dedicated it the animal is holy but is not offered it affects exchange and its exchange Talmud, Mosti Murabi has the same status you can deduce from this three things you can deduce from this that animals dedicated for sacrifices can be removed forever from sacred use you can also deduce from this that the holiness of animals dedicated for their value can be removed you can also deduce from this that a removal from sacred use at the beginning of a dedication is valid forever said of all the authorities concerned agree even our Jose that if he says a half of an animal shall be a burnt offering and the other half an animal tithe all are agreed that it is offered as a burnt offering what is the ruling however if he says a half of an animal shall be an exchange and half of an animal tithe is the animal offered as an exchange since it the exchange applies to all dedications or is it perhaps offered as an animal tithe since the animal before the tenth and the succeeding one are consecrated let it remain undecided mission if one says behold this animal I asked a hot instead of this behold this is holy fat in place of this behold this is temurth the exchange of this each of these I asked the case of a valid exchange if however one says this shall be redeemed for this it is not the case of a valid exchange and if the dedicated animal was blemished it becomes Hullen and he is required to make up the Hullen to the value of the dedicated animal. Gemara does this mean to say that the word Tahat has the meaning of occupying the place of this is contradicted by the following as regards dedications for temple repairs. If one says Halifath this Temurath this he has said nothing. If however one says Tahat this this is redeemed for this his words stand now. If we suppose that the word Tahat has the meaning of occupying the place of what is the difference between the first and second clause of the Beretha said Abay the word Tahat is used in the sense of occupying the place of and in the sense of redeeming in the sense of occupying the place of as scripture says Talmud, Masti Mura, but if the bright spot stay Tata in its place and in the sense of redeeming as it says for Tahat the brass I will bring gold this being the case the matter was left in the hand of the sages with regard to dedications for the altar which can affect exchange to hot has the meaning of occupying the place of whereas with regard to dedications for temple repairs which do not affect exchange to hot has the meaning of redeeming Rabbah said even in connection with dedication for the altar the word to hot sometimes has the sense of redeeming as e.g. where the dedicated animal was blemished said Arashi even in connection with the blemished dedicated animal to hot sometimes has the sense of redeeming and sometimes has the sense of occupying the place of as follows if he placed his hand on a dedicated blemished animal the animal becomes Holland but if he placed his hand on an animal of Holland it becomes dedicated Abbe inquired what is the ruling if there were two dedicated blemished animals before him and two unblemished animals of Holland and he says let these be to hot in place of these did he intend to substitute them the former or did he intend to redeem them with the eater and if you say that where there exists a legitimate way a man will not abandon what is permitted and do what is forbidden what is the ruling if he had two dedicated animals before him one of which was blemished and two animals of Holland one of which was blemished and he said let these be taught instead of these did he mean the unblemished in place of the unblemished in the sense of being substituted and the blemished animal of Holland in place of the dedicated blemished animal in the sense of being redeemed or perhaps the unblemished animal of Holland in place of the blemished dedicated animal and the blemished animal of Holland in place of the unblemished dedicated animal and in both cases there is a punishment of lashes and if you say that wherever there exists a legitimate way a man will not do what is forbidden and therefore he means to redeem and there is no punishment of lashes what is the ruling if there were three dedicated animals before him one of which was blemished and three unblemished animals of Holland and he says behold these shall be instead of these do we say since when he says these two unblemished animals instead of the unblemished animals he means they are to be substituted so when he says the unblemished animal of Holland instead of the dedicated blemished animal he also means they are to be substituted or perhaps here too we apply the principle that wherever there exists a legitimate way a man will not do what is forbidden and therefore in the latter case he meant to redeem and if you say that here too since nevertheless there is no presumption against this man as regards prohibitions we say that a man would not abandon what is permitted and do what is forbidden Arashi inquired what is the ruling if one had four dedicated animals before him one of which was blemished and four unblemished animals of Holland and he says let these be instead of these here in this case since there is certainly a presumption against the man as regards prohibitions do we say
Slaves bonds immovable properties and dedications shall we say then that this refers to the cancellation of the sale but will our Yohanan hold in such a case that he is required to make up the value of a dedication according to the rabbinical law Talmud, Mastim Yerubi has not our Jeremiah with reference to immovable properties of Hullen and our Jonah with reference to dedications both reported in the name of our Yohanan that only the law of overreaching does not apply to them but the law of a cancelled sale does apply to them one can still say that the reference is to the cancellation of the sale and reverse the names but how can you say that the names shall be reversed this would be quite right according to the authority of our Jonah who holds that our Yohanan refers to dedications and therefore all the more does the rule apply to immovable properties but according to the authority of our Jeremiah who holds that our Yohanan refers only to immovable properties but that too. Dedications the law of cancellation of the sale does not apply how can you reverse the names of the disputants our Jeremiah can answer you there is no need for you to reverse the names must we say that our Jonah and our Jeremiah differ with regard to Samuel's dictum for Samuel said if Hittish of the value of Amena was redeemed for the value of a paratot it is a valid act our Jonah not accepting Samuel's dictum whereas our Jeremiah does accept Samuel's dictum no both masters agree with Samuel R. Jonah holding that Samuel's dictum only refers to a case where the act has been done but that it is not permissible in the first instance whereas our Jeremiah holds that it is permissible even in the first instance and if you prefer another solution I may say one still need not reverse the names even according to our Jonah and as regards the difficulty you raise from the mission which says to the following overreaching does not apply dedications etc this will be in accordance with the opinion. Of our histoph or our histah said what is the meaning of the Mishnah to the following overreaching does not apply it means they do not come under the law of overreaching since in their case money even less than the amount which constitutes overreaching has to be returned said well the Mishnah only refers to where two people made the assessment but where three made the assessment even if a hundred came afterwards there is no redress but it is not so has not our Safra said the principle that two. Our odd PAR with a hundred only applies to the giving of evidence but with regard to making an assessment he is the opinion of all the authorities that we go by the views expressed and moreover even if there were three against three do we not follow the latter set since Hittish always has the preference Ola holds our Mishnah when it says he is required to make up to the value of the dedication means in accordance with rabbinic law and with reference to a rabbinic requirement the rabbis. Adopted the lenient view mission if one says behold this animal shall be instead of a burnt offering this shall be instead of a sin offering he has said nothing but if he says instead of the sin offering and instead of this burnt offering or instead of the sin offering and instead of the burnt offering which I have in the house and he had it in the house his words stand if he says concerning an unclean animal or a blemished dedicated animal behold these shall be a burnt offering he has said nothing but if he says behold they shall be for a burnt offering they are sold and the burnt offering I has bought with their money Amara Rab Judah reported in the name of Rab the mission is not the opinion of Armayur for if it were the opinion of Armayur he holds that a man does not utter words for no purpose behold these shall be for a burnt offering they are sold and the burnt offering I has bought with the money now the reason is because it is an unclean animal or a blemished animal since they are not fit for the altar and therefore they do not require a blemish before selling but if one set aside a female animal for a guilt offering or a burnt offering a blemish is required before selling Rab Judah reports in the name of Rab our mission will thus not be the opinion of our Simeon for we have learned our Simeon says it shall be sold even if without a blemish Talmud, Mastim Ura Chapterv I mission all animals forbidden for the altar render others unfit however few. The former may be such cases are an animal which covered a woman and an animal that was covered by a man Muxa Nebata harlots hire the price of a dog kill a yim trifa and the foetus extracted by the means of a Caesarean section what is meant by Muxa that which has been set aside for idolatrous use at the animal itself is forbidden but what is upon it is permitted and what is meant by Nebata that which has been used for idolatry both at the animal itself and that which is upon it are forbidden in both cases however the animal may be eaten Gemara it has been said all animals forbidden for the altar render others unfit however few the former may be now what does the mission inform us that the animals forbidden for the altar are not neutralized in any larger number of animals but have we not learned this in a mission if any dedicated animals became mixed up with the sin offerings which are condemned to die or with an ox condemned to be stoned even one in ten thousand which are forbidden all are condemned to die and we raise the question what does the Mishnah mean by the word even and it was answered it means this if any of the sin offerings which are condemned to die became mixed up with dedicated animals or an ox condemned to be stoned became mixed up even one in ten thousand all are condemned to die it is necessary you might think that there since the animals are prohibited from being used profitably there is no neutralization. Whereas here since the animals are permitted to be profitably used I might have thought that they are neutralized in any larger number our Mishnah therefore informs us that it is not so but have we not also learned the cases of an animal which covered a woman and an animal that was covered by a man if dedications became mixed up with an animal of Hullen which covered a woman and an animal of Hullen which was covered by a man they all pasture until blemished they are then. Sold and with the money of the best among them he brings an offering from the same kind said Arkahana I recited this tradition in the presence of Arshai B. Ashi he said to me one mission deals with Hullen and the other mission deals with dedicated animals and it was necessary to teach both cases for if we had been taught only the case of dedicated animals we might have thought that the reason was because the forbidden animals are rejected as unseemly whereas in the case of Hullen we might have thought that the forbidden animals are neutralized but have we not also learned this with reference to Hullen the following are forbidden and render forbidden other Hullen however minute in quantity forbidden one idols birds brought by a leper hides pierced at the heart the hair of a Nazi right the firstborn of an ass meat and milk boiled together an ox condemned to be stoned a heifer whose neck was broken Hullen which was killed in the temple court and the goat sent away to as is all these are forbidden and render other Hullen forbidden however small in quantity it was necessary to teach both Mishnahs for if we had been informed only of the Mishnah there we might have thought that the reason was because the cases mentioned are prohibited for general use but here we might have thought they are neutralized in greater numbers and if we had been informed only here we might have said that the reason was because it is loathsome to use the animals for the altar. But for private use we might have thought that even things which are forbidden to be profitably used are neutralized in the greater numbers our Mishnah therefore informs us that it is not so and whence do we derive that the case of an animal that covered a woman and an animal which was covered by a man are forbidden for the altar our rabbis have taught scripture says of the cattle this excludes the cases of an animal which covered a woman and an animal which was covered by a man but can we not derive this from an analogy of a blemished animal with which no sinful act has been done is forbidden for the altar how much more should an animal that covered a woman and an animal which was covered by a man be forbidden for the altar let the law concerning one who plows with an ox and an ass together decide since a sinful act has been done with it and yet it is allowed for the altar the case of plowing with an ass and an ox together is however different since there is no punishment of death incurred whereas in the cases of an animal that covered a woman and an animal which was covered by a man the punishment of death is incurred then take away the argument you have brought and say that you can rely upon the above analogy for the case of an animal with which a sinful act has been done according to the testimony of two witnesses but once do we learn the case where a sinful act had been done according to the testimony of only one witness or where the owners confessed said our Simeon I will bring forward an analogy as follows if in the case of a blemished animal where the testimony of two witnesses does not disqualify the animal from being eaten the testimony of one witness disqualifies it from being offered on the altar then in the cases of an animal that covered a woman and an animal which was covered by a man where the testimony of two witnesses disqualifies the animal from being eaten how much more should the testimony of one witness disqualify the animal from being offered on the altar the text therefore states of the cattle to exclude the cases of an animal that covered a woman and an animal which was covered by a man but have you not just inferred this from an analogy Talmud Mastim Yerubi said Arashi because there is an objection to the basis of the analogy as follows the case of a blemished animal is different since its blemish is visible can you however say the same as regards the case of an animal which covered a woman and an
Because the scriptural text made a limitation, but if the text had not made a limitation, the overlays would be permitted, but is it not written, and you shall destroy their names, implying everything made for them, that is, for the purpose of substituting a name for the idols. When the idolaters call a place Bethalia, Israelites should call it Beth Karia Pina they should call Pina Kaleb and Kol, they should call Ankaz, and why not reverse the exclusions from the text as follows of the cattle excludes any bat, and even of the herd excludes the cases of an animal that covered a woman and an animal that was covered by a man. In the one case, we exclude something which is associated with the subject of the text, and in the other, we also exclude something which is associated with the subject of the text with regard to the feminine term Behima cattle. It is written, and if a man lie with a Behima beast, he shall surely be put to death, and with regard to the masculine term baker herd it is written thus they changed their glory with the similitude of an ox that eat grass of the flock excludes muksa and of the flock excludes the goring ox from the altar said our simian if scripture excludes the case of robo what need is there for the exclusion of the goring ox and if scripture excludes the case of the goring ox what need is there for the exclusion of the case of robo because there is a law applying to robo which does not apply to the goro and there is a law applying to the goro which does not apply to robo there is a law as regards robo that the unintentional act is on a par with the intentional act unlike the case of the goro there is a regulation applying to the goro that the owner of the ox pays indemnity unlike the case of robo there is need therefore for scripture to mention the exclusion of robo and the goro and the following tenet derives this from here as follows for it has been taught as regards Roba and Nirba etc. If one dedicated them they are like dedicated animals in which a transitory blemish occurred before their dedication and which require a permanent blemish in order to redeem them since it says because their corruption is in them there is a blemish in them but how can you derive that from the text a clause is missing in the Beritha which should read as follows whence do we infer that they are forbidden for the altar because scripture says because their corruption is in then there is a blemish in them and a tenna of the school of our Ishmael taught whenever the term hash hath a corruption is used in the scriptures it refers to lewdness and idolatry lewdness as it says for all flesh had corrupted its way etc. and idolatry as it says lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image the similitude of any figure we thus argue wherever a blemish disqualifies an animal for the altar lewdness and idolatry also disqualify them and how does the of it? School of Ar Ishmael expound the text of the cattle of the herd and of the flock. These texts are required by him in order to exclude the following cases a sick old or evil smelling animal. Now the former Tana quoted above who derives the cases of Roba and Nirba is unfit for the altar from those texts whence does he derive the cases of a sick old and evil smelling animal as being forbidden for the altar he derives these from the text and if of the flock of the sheep or of the goats. And what will the Tana of the school of Ar Ishmael do with these texts? It is a way of scripture to speak in such a manner what is meant by Muksa that which has been set aside for idolatrous use, etc. Said Reshlakish Muksa is forbidden only if it had been set aside for seven years since it says and it came to pass that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even a second bullock of seven years old, but there in the text was it only a case of Muksa, was it not also a case of any bad said Araha son of our Jacob it was designated for idolatry but they did not actually use it as an idol Rabbah says one can still maintain that they actually used it the bull as an idol but there it was an innovation as our Abu Bikahana explained for our Abu Bikahana said eight things were permitted at night as follows the killing of an animal outside the tabernacle the killing at night the officiating by a non-priest Talmud, Masti Mureh without a ministering vessel. Ministering with vessels of Asherah the wood of Asherah Muksa and Anibad are Togibim and reported in the name of our Josiah wherein the Torah is Muksa intimated since it says Shalya observe to offer unto me intimating that every dedication requires special observation to the Sabbath murder if this is so if one brought a lean line without having kept it under observation is it really the case that it is not fit to be offered on the altar here Toby replied to him Abay I mean the text. Says Shalya observe to offer unto me unto me implying but not to another lord what is meant by another lord to whom offering is made it is idolatry Rabbah son of Arad reported in the name of our Isaac Muksa remains forbidden only until it has been used for some work or reported in the name of our Yohanan until the animal is handed over to the ministers of the idol to be eaten Bihar reported in the name of our Yohanan until they feed the animal with vegetables set aside for idolatry said Arabahu. Bihadu you and Ola differ he replied to him no Ola himself means that it is fed with vegetables set aside for idolatry Arabah said Bihadu knew how to explain this teaching had he not however gone there Palestine he would not have known how to explain it for it was the land of Israel which was the cause said our Isaac to him Bihadu belonged to both Babylon and the land of Israel our Hanania of tried to recite it in the presence of our Yohanan Muksa remains forbidden only until some act has been done with. It he taught this and also explained what is meant by some act such as shearing its wool or doing some work with it what is meant by any ebat etc whence is this proof said our papa since scripture says from the well-watered pastures of israel this intimates from what is legitimate for israel now if you were to assume that they are forbidden for private use what need is there for a special scriptural text to exclude them from the altar but is it the case that wherever a thing is forbidden for private use there is no need for a scriptural text is there not the case of travel which is forbidden for private use and yet a scriptural text excludes it from being offered on the altar for it has been taught even of the herd excludes any bad perhaps it is not so and the object of the text is to exclude travel when scripture however says further on of the herd which there is no need to repeat it must be in order to exclude the case of travel from the altar both texts are necessary for you might think that the text refers to a case where the animal became trifa and then it was dedicated but where the animal was dedicated and then it became trifa I might have thought that it is legitimate for the altar but we do not derive this from the following it says whatsoever passeth under the rod thus excluding the case of trifa which cannot pass the text is also necessary you might have thought that the former text refers only to an animal which was at no time fit for the altar having been born a trifa in the inside of its mother but in a case where it was fit at one time for the altar and it was born and then became trifa I might have thought that it is legitimate for the altar the text therefore teaches us that it is not so mission what is meant by a harlot's hire if one says to a harlot take this lamb for your hire even if there are a hundred lambs they are all forbidden for the altar similarly if one says to his fellow here is a lamb and a son. Your non Israelitish maid servant for my servant Armeir says that the lamb I is not regarded as harlot's hire, whereas the sages say it is regarded as harlot's hire. Gemara the master says, even if there are a hundred lambs, they are all forbidden. How is this meant? Shall I say that she took a hundred animals for her hire? Surely it is obvious that they are all forbidden for the altar. What is the difference whether there be one or a hundred lambs? No, it is necessary in a case where she took one lamb as her hire and he gave her a hundred. All are then forbidden since they all come by reason of the hire. Our rabbis have taught if he gave her but he had no intercourse with her, if he had intercourse with her but did not give her her hire is legitimate for the altar. In the case where he gave her but did not have intercourse with her, do you call this her hire? And moreover, the case where he had intercourse with her but did not give her, you say that her hire is legitimate, but what did? He give her what is meant is this if he gave her and then had intercourse with her or if he had intercourse with her and then gave her a lamb for her hire it is legitimate for the altar but should not the law of harlot's hire take effect retrospectively said our Eliezer Talmud, Masti Mirabi we are dealing with a case where she offered the lamb before intercourse how are we to understand this shall we say that he gave her immediate possession of the lamb surely it is obvious that it is legitimate for the altar since so far he has had no intercourse with her shall we then suppose that he said do not acquire ownership of it the lamb until the time of intercourse but can she in such conditions offer it seeing that the divine law says and when a man shall sanctify his house to be holy unto the Lord and we infer just as his house is in his possession so all things must be in his possession no it is necessary where he said the lamb shall not be acquired by you until the time of intercourse, but if you need it, let it be acquired by you from now. Our Ashai asked, What is the ruling if she dedicated the lamb before the intercourse? But why not solve this from the teaching of our Eliezer? Since our Eliezer said about where she offered the lamb before
that he said to her submit to intercourse for a lamb without specifying and if he said to her submit to intercourse for this animal is the animal forbidden for the altar is not Meshika still wanting we are dealing with a non-Israelitish harlot who does not acquire possession by Meshika and if you prefer another solution I may say that we are even dealing with an Israelitish harlot where e.g. the animal is standing in her courtyard if so surely he gave it to her at the beginning and Moreover surely the animal is forbidden in such a case we suppose that he assigned to her the animal as security and said to her if I give you your money on a certain day well and good and if not the whole lamb will be your hire said Rab the law of harlots hire applies to a male and to all forbidden relations except the hire of his wife when she is an what is the reason it is written the harlot and it is not a harlot Levi however says even of his wife when an what is the reason it is written an abomination and this is also an abomination but as to Levi is it not written as own harlot he can answer you it is to intimate zona but not zona and whence will Rab infer the limitation of zona but not zona he would derive it from the dictum of rabbi for it has been taught rabbi said hire is forbidden only when it comes to him through a transgression but the hire of his wife when it or payments for her loss of time or if she the harlot gave him a Lamb for hire, these are legitimate for the altar, and although there is no proof for it in the Bible, there is an indication of its scripture saying, and in that thou givest hire, and no hire is given unto thee, thus thou art contrary. And what does Rab do with the text and abomination? He needs it for the teaching of Abbe. For Abbe said, The hire of a heathen harlot is forbidden for the altar. What is the reason here? It is written an abomination, and their scripture says, For whosoever shall commit any of these abominations, we therefore argue just as there the reference is to forbidden relations where betrothal has no effect. Similarly, here in the case of a harlot, we are dealing with a case where betrothal has no legal effect, and a priest who has intercourse with her is not punished with lashes for having intercourse with his own. What is the reason since scripture says, And he shall not profane his seed, implying such seed as is attributed to him to the exclusion of a heathen woman? Whose seed is not attributed to him, the hire of an Israelitish harlot is legitimate for the altar. What is the reason? Because betrothal has effect with her, and a priest who has intercourse with her is punishable with lashes for having intercourse with his owner. What is the reason? Because his seed is attributed to him. Rabbah, however, says in both cases her hire is forbidden for the altar, and a priest who has intercourse with her is punishable with lashes for having intercourse with his owner. What is the reason we infer one from the other? Just as in the case of an Israelitish harlot, there is a negative command. Similarly, there is a negative command in connection with a heathen harlot, and just as the hire of a heathen harlot is forbidden for the altar, similarly the hire of an Israelitish harlot is also forbidden for the altar. An objection was raised: the hire of either a heathen harlot or an Israelitish harlot is forbidden for the altar. Shall we say that this refutes Abay Abay? Can answer you this will represent the view of our Akiba who holds that betrothal takes no effect in relationships involving the infringement of a negative command but does not the Beretha say in a later clause as e.g. a widow for a high priest and a divorcee or one who has performed halizah for a common priest her hire is forbidden this is what the Beretha informs us that in the case of any harlot with whom betrothal takes no effect as is the case with a widow for a high priest the hire is forbidden and according to Rabba why does the Beretha say as e.g. the case of a widow for a high priest the Beretha means it is like the case of a widow for a high priest just as a widow for a high priest is not punishable with lashes until she is warned similarly with a the harlot there is no prohibition until he said to her here is the hire thus excluding the teaching of our Eliezer for our Eliezer said if an unmarried man had intercourse with an unmarried woman without the intention thereby of making her his wife he makes her a harlot where however she is already a harlot even if he gave her a lamb without giving the reason Rabbah also agrees that it is forbidden for the altar another version the Beretha above refers to forbidden relations where betrothals take no effect but does not the latter clause say as e.g. a widow for a high priest a divorcee or one who has performed halizah for a common priest her hire is forbidden now in these cases betrothals take effect the Beretha will represent the opinion of Talmud Mastim Ura R. Eliezer who said if an unmarried man has intercourse with an unmarried woman without the intention thereby of making her his wife he makes her a harlot if the Beretha represents the opinion of R. Eliezer why take the case of a widow for a high priest why not take the case of an unmarried woman it was necessary to take the case of a widow for a high priest for otherwise you might think that since this is a typical case other cases are not forbidden. The Beretha informs us that it is not so if one says to his fellow, Here is this lamb for you, etc., but is not a bondwoman permitted for a slave, said Arhu, not the Mishnah means for himself, and the reason why it says my slave is because it is a more refined expression to use if this is so. What is the reason of our Meir, said Samuel, son of our Isaac? One can still say that the Mishnah actually means my slave, and it refers to a Hebrew slave if this is so. What is the reason of the rabbi since a bondwoman is permitted for a Hebrew slave? The case here is where he does not possess a wife and children, for it has been taught if a Hebrew slave does not possess a wife and children, his master cannot hand over a Canaanite slave to him, but if he possesses a wife and children, his master can hand over a Canaanite slave to him. Mishnah, and what is meant by the price of a dog if one says to his fellow, Here is this lamb instead of this dog, and likewise if two. Partners divided an estate and one took ten lambs and the other nine and a dog. All those taken instead of the dog are forbidden for the altar, but those taken with the dog are legitimate for the altar. The hire of a dog and the price of a harlot are legitimate for the altar since it says for even both of these both but not for their issue are legitimate for the altar since it says both of these implying they but not their issue. Gemara our rabbis have taught a mechir of a dog this. Refers to that taken in exchange for a dog and likewise it says thou sellest that people for naught and hast not set high their price and why not say that mechir means the hire of a dog. The text both implies but not three but did we suggest the hire and the price of a dog. What we suggested is that it means the hire and not the price if so let scripture say thou shalt not bring the hire of a harlot and a dog since scripture says the hire of a harlot or the price of a dog you can prove from. Here that it means the price but not the hire of a dog partners who divided their estate and one took etc. But why not take out one lamb for the dog and all the remaining lambs should then be legitimate for the altar. We are dealing here with a case where the value of a dog was greater than the value of any one of the corresponding lambs and this additional amount is distributed over all the corresponding lambs. The hire of a dog and the price of a harlot are legitimate etc. said. Rabbah Parzakia to our Ashi Talmud, Mastim Yerubi whence do we derive what the rabbis taught that the term harlotry does not apply to animals. He said to him if that were so scripture would not omit to say the hire of a harlot and a dog we have learned to the same effect whence do we infer that the hire of a dog and the price of a harlot are legitimate for the altar because it says both but not for their issue are legitimate for the altar since it says both of them implying they but not. Their issue said Rabbah the issue of a beast which was used for buggery while pregnant is disqualified for the altar for mother and young have been abused the issue of a beast which gored while pregnant is disqualified for the altar for mother and young have gored the issue of a beast which was designated for idolatry or used for idolatry while pregnant is legitimate for the altar what is the reason its mother was designated for idolatry and its mother was used as such some there are who say even the issue of a beast which was designated or used for idolatry while pregnant is also disqualified for the altar what is the reason its full appearance is welcome to him or ahad boy bmi in the name of Rab reported if one betrothed with the dung of an ox condemned to be stoned the act is valid if one betrothed however with the dung of the calf set aside for idolatry the act is not valid what is the reason I may say it is intimated in scripture and I may say that reason Tells us so I may say that reason tells us so since for purposes of idol worship its full appearance is welcome to him whereas in the case of an ox condemned to be stoned its full appearance is not welcome to him I may say it is intimated in scripture with reference to idolatry it is written lest thou be a cursed thing like it thus intimating that whatever comes from it is like it and forbidden whereas with reference to an ox condemned to be stoned it is written and its flesh shall not be eaten. Its flesh is forbidden its tongue is permitted mission if he gave her a harlot money as hire it is legitimate for the altar but if he gave her wine oil flour and anything similar which is offered on the altar it is
Legitimate for the altar set are Joseph Urian who came from Esporak recited Bath Shammai forbid whereas Beth Hillel permit Beth Hillel hold scripture says them implying but not their issue them but not their products Beth Shammai however hold them implies but not their issue and the word even includes their products but do not Beth Hillel see that is is written even even is according to the opinion of Beth Hillel indeed a difficulty our rabbis have taught scripture says in the house of the Lord thy God this excludes the case of the red heifer which does not come to the house this is the teaching of our Eliezer the sages however say this includes beaten gold plates as forbidden for overlaying whose opinion is that of the sages said our his diet is that of our Jose B. Judah for it has been taught if he gave her gold as higher our Jose B. Judah said one must not use it to make beaten gold plates even for the space behind the holy of holies if he gave her dedicated animals they are Legitimate, etc. And why should not the law of a harlot's higher and price of a dog take effect with dedicated animals? A minority, if in the case of birds where a blemish does not disqualify them from being offered, the law of higher and price have effect. In the case of dedicated animals where a blemish disqualifies them, is there not all the more reason that the law of higher and price should have effect? The text therefore states for any vow thus excluding what has already been vowed. Now the reason is because a scriptural text excludes them the dedications, but if a scriptural text had not excluded them, I might have thought that if he gave a harlot dedicated animals, the law of higher and price would apply to them. But can a man forbid what does not belong to him? Said Arashai, we are dealing with a case where he assigns her as higher a share in his Passover lamb, and it is the opinion of Rabbi, for it has been taught scripture says, and if the household be too little for the lamb, give him to. Live from the lamb sufficient for food but not for a purchase rabbi however says even sufficient for a purchase if he had not the wherewithal he can assign a share for others together with himself in his Passover lamb and his festival offerings the money being hollow for it was on such a condition that Israel dedicated their Passover lambs the issue of all animals which are disqualified for the altar etc said rab the issue of all animals which are disqualified for the altar are legitimate for the altar and with reference to this it was taught that our Eliezer forbids are not behind and reported in the name of Arnam and the difference of opinion refers only in the case where they were pregnant and in the end were used for buggery our Eliezer holding that an embryo is considered as the thigh of its mother whereas the rabbis hold that an embryo is not considered as the thigh of its mother but where they were used for buggery and afterwards they became pregnant it is the unanimous opinion of all the authorities that they the issue are legitimate for the altar rabbis says the difference of opinion only refers to the case where they were used for buggery and afterwards became pregnant our Eliezer holding that a produce of combined causes is forbidden whereas the rabbis hold that a product of combined causes is permitted but where they were pregnant and then were used for buggery it is the opinion of all the authorities concerned that they are forbidden for the altar rabbis follows. The opinion expressed by him elsewhere for rabbis says the issue of a beast which was used for buggery while pregnant is disqualified for the altar for both mother and young have been abused the issue of a beast which gored while pregnant is disqualified for the altar for both mother and young have gored another version are who not behind and reported in the name of Arnam and the difference of opinion refers only where they were used for buggery while they were consecrated our Eliezer holding that this is a degrading thing whereas the rabbis hold that it is not so but where they were used for buggery as hull and since there is a change in status it is the opinion of all the authorities concerned that they the issue are legitimate for the altar robber reported in the name of Arnam and the difference of opinion is the same even if they were used for buggery as hull and our Eliezer holding that it is a degrading thing whereas the rabbis hold that since there was a change in status they are legitimate for the altar but where they were used for buggery while consecrated it is the opinion of all the authorities concerned that they are forbidden for the altar Talmud, Mosti Mira the issue of a trifa etc. According to the authority who holds that a trifa can give birth we can explain the mission here as referring to a case where e.g. it became trifa and afterwards became pregnant and the point at issue is that our Eliezer holds that a product of combined causes is forbidden. Whereas the rabbis hold that the product of combined causes is permitted according to the authority who holds that a trifa cannot give birth it can be explained as referring to a case where e.g. it became pregnant and afterwards became trifa and the point at issue is that our Eliezer holds that an embryo is considered as the thigh of its mother whereas the rabbis hold that an embryo is not considered as the thigh of its mother said Arunah the sages agree with our Eliezer that the young bird from the egg of a bird that became trifa is forbidden for the altar what is the reason the sages differ from our Eliezer only in the case of the issue of a trifa since it develops from the ear whereas in the case of a young bird from the egg of a bird that became trifa since it develops from the body of the bird even the rabbis agree said Rabbi to Arunah we have the confirmation of your opinion as follows a tearwood full of worms that come from a living person who then died our Eliezer declares to be ritually unclean whereas the sages declare them clean now the rabbis differ with our Eliezer only as regards worms of a human body since they are considered merely as a discharge but in the case of an egg since it is part of the body of the bird even the rabbis would agree said Abbe to him but it is not logically the reverse our Eliezer only differs from the rabbis in the case of a worm since a man even when alive is described as a worm as it is written how much less man that is a worm and son of man that is a maggot but in the case of a young bird even our Eliezer would admit it is fit for the altar and moreover it has been explicitly taught our Eliezer agrees with the sages in the case of a young bird from an egg from a bird that became trifa that it is legitimate for the altar he robber replied to Abbe if it has been taught it has been taught our hand of Antigona says a ritually clean animal etc what is the reason shall we say because it becomes fat from it if this is so if he feeds it with veggies set aside for idolatry is it really forbidden rather it is as our Hananah tried to recite it in the presence of our Yohanan you suppose for instance that it sucked hot milk from a trifa every morning since it can live for 24 hours one may not redeem any dedicated animal which became trifa etc whence is this derived our rabbis have taught scripture says thou mayest kill any flesh thou mayest kill implies but no shearing and eat but not for that dogs flesh but not milk hence we infer that one must not redeem dedications in order to give them to dogs to eat another version the text thou mayest kill any flesh implies that the permission to eat commences only from the time of killing and onwards because he the tana here holds that it is permitted to redeem dedications in order to give them to dogs to eat chaptervii mission there are regulations which apply to dedications for the altar which do not apply to dedications for repairs of the temple and there are regulations which apply to dedications for the repairs of the temple which do not apply to dedications for the altar for dedications for the altar effect exchange they are subject to the laws of pickle nuthar and ritual uncle and s talmud must he be their issue and milk are forbidden after their redemption if one kills them without the temple court he is guilty of a transgression and wages are not paid from them to artisans which is not the case with dedications for temple repairs there are regulations which apply to dedications for the repairs of the temple which are not found elsewhere since unspecified dedications go to the repairs of the temple dedication for the repairs of the temple takes effect on all things the law of sacrilege applies to their products and there is no benefit to be derived from them for the priest Gemara now is this a general rule that all dedications for the altar effect exchange is there not a case of birds which are dedicated for the altar and we have learned meal offerings and birds do not affect exchange the mission speaks only of beasts but is there not the case of the offspring of a dedicated animal which is a dedication for the altar and we have learned the offspring of a dedicated animal does not affect exchange our mission represents the opinion of our Judah who holds that the offspring can affect exchange but is not the exchange itself a dedication for the altar and we have learned one exchange cannot affect another exchange the mission refers to original dedications now that you have arrived at this conclusion you may even say that the mission above will be in accordance also with the opinion of the rabbis the disputants of our Judah since it only refers to original dedications and wages are not paid from them to artisans etc we infer that we do pay from the dedications for the repair of the temple once do we derive the set our about since scripture says and let them make me a sanctuary intimating from what is mine there are regulations which apply to dedications for the repairs of the temple unspecified dedications go for the repairs of the temple who is the tana who holds that unspecified dedications go for the repairs of the temple our high bab reported in the name of our
For burnt offerings, therefore, even the male animals are also not meant for burnt offerings. Our Joshua, however, says a man does divide his vow. Another version is current as follows. Our Abba Ahab reported in the name of Rab if he dedicated animals only. Even our Eliezer admits since a man does not ignore dedications for the altar and make dedications for the repairs of the temple. The point at issue, however, is where there is other property with them. The animals are Eliezer holding that one does not divide his vow. And since therefore the rest of the estate is not for dedications for the altar, the animals of the estate are also not for the altar. Whereas our Joshua says a man does not divide his vow. Now, according to the latter version of our Abba Ahab's teaching, it is in order to state above their monies together with the rest of the estate go for the repair of the temple. It is for this reason that it says together with the rest of the estate go for the repair of the temple. But According to the first version of our Addis teaching, let our Eliezer say that the monies shall go to the repairs of the temple. Do in fact read so, and their monies go for the repair of the temple. Dedications for the repairs of the temple take effect on all things. What does this include? Said Rubin. It includes the shavings of a tree and sprouting sacrilege applies to their products. What does this include? Said our Papa. It includes the milk of dedicated animals and the eggs of turtle doves. As we learned with regard to milk of dedicated animals and eggs of turtle doves, one may not benefit from them, nor does the law of sacrilege apply to them. This only refers to dedications of the altar. But as regards dedications for repairs of the temple, e.g., if one dedicated a hen, the law of sacrilege applies to its eggs. If one dedicated the value of a she asked for the repairs of the temple, the law of sacrilege applies to its milk. And even according to the authority who holds that the law of Sacrilege applies to the products of dedications for the altar. This only refers to products which are fit for the altar, but to products which are not fit for the altar, the law of sacrilege does not apply. Talmud, Mosti, Mura, Mishnah, neither dedications for the altar nor dedications for the repairs of the temple may be changed from one holiness to another. We may dedicate them with a value dedicatlon and we may declare them Hurim if they die, they are buried. Our Simeon says dedications for the repairs of the temple if they die, they are redeemed. Kamara said, Arhunah, if one designated dedications for the altar for dedications as priestly property, his action is of no consequence. What is the reason? Scripture says every devoted thing is most holy unto the Lord, intimating that every devoted thing that comes from what is most holy belongs to the Lord. An objection was raised if one designated dedications for repairs to the temple, whether for dedication for the altar or for dedication as Priestly property his action is of no consequence if one designated dedications for priestly property whether for dedication for the altar or for dedication for the repairs of the temple his action is of no consequence now this implies that if one designated dedications for the altar by dedicating them as priestly property his action is valid shall we say that this refutes Arhuna Arhuna can answer you when the Tana leaves over this case it is for the purpose of teaching that if he designated dedications for the altar for the repairs of the temple his action is valid but if for dedication as priestly property his action is of no consequence but why not state this case together with others in the Beritha above he the Tana in the Beritha mentions a case which has both aspects but does not state a rule which has not both aspects we have learned we may dedicate them with a value dedication and we may declare them and now does not the expression value dedication refer to the dedication for the repairs of the temple and the expression we may declare them her mean as priestly property no in both cases the reference is to dedications for the repairs of the temple and the Mishnah teaches that it is immaterial whether he expresses this in the language of dedication for the repairs of the temple or in the language of her for the repairs of the temple but it is not so for it has been taught we may dedicate them with a value dedication for the repairs of the temple and we may declare them her as priestly property and moreover it has been explicitly taught if dedications for the altar are dedicated as priestly property the act is valid shall we say that this refutes Arhuna it is a refutation but does not Arhuna it is a scriptural text said Ula scripture could have said a devoted thing and it says every devoted thing but did Ula say this did not Ula say if one designated a burnt offering for the repairs of the temple there is nothing to Prevent the offering of a sacrifice except that we must wait Talmud, Mosti Murabi for the approach of the temple treasurer as representatives of the owners of Beritha above means rabbinically and the Bible text refers to sacrilege you say in respect of sacrilege but what need is there for a Bible text for this purpose is it not written in this connection it is most holy and suppose scripture does say so has not Arjani taught the law of sacrilege is not explicitly mentioned in the Torah except in the case of a burnt offering since it says if a soul commit a trespass and sin through ignorance in the holy things of the Lord which means such dedications as are exclusively to the Lord but that the law of sacrilege applies to a sin offering and guilt offering is derived only from the teaching of Rabbi as it has been taught Rabbi says the text all fat is the Lord's this includes the Emurim of dedications of a minor grade as subject to the law of sacrilege now here too we may Ask what need is there for a Bible text for does it not say in connection with sin offering and guilt offering most holy we see then that although scripture says most holy in that connection there is need for a text to include them under the law of sacrilege and the same applies to her and that although the text says in that connection most holy there is need for a special text to include them under the law of sacrilege the text stated above if one dedicated a burnt offering there is nothing to prevent the offering of a sacrifice except that we must wait for the approach of the temple treasurer's an objection was raised if one dedicated a burnt offering for the repairs of the temple one must not kill it until it is redeemed it is a rabbinical enactment it also stands to reason since the latter clause of the Beritha says if he transgressed and killed it the action is valid now if it were from the Torah why is the act valid then what will you say that it is a rabbinical enactment if so read the latter clause and if he unlawfully used the burnt offering he has transgressed twice the law of sacrilege now if it were only a rabbinical enactment why are there two transgressions of the law of sacrilege the the means as follows and it is capable of involving one in two transgressions of sacrilege and if they die they are buried etc said are Yohanan according to the rabbis of the mission both dedications for the altar and dedications for the repairs of the temple are included in the law requiring the sacrifice to be presented and appraised Rush Lakish however says according to the rabbis dedications for repairs of the temple were included in the law of being presented and appraised whereas dedications of the altar were not included in the law of being presented and appraised and both admit that according to our Simeon the dedications for the repairs of the temple were not included in the law of being presented and appraised whereas dedications for the temple were included in the law of being set down and appraised and both admit that according to all the authorities concerned an animal blemished from the beginning before dedication is not included in the law of being presented and appraised we have learned our Simeon says dedications for the repairs of the temple which died are redeemed now this is quite correct according to our Yohanan who says that according to the rabbis both dedications for the altar and dedications for the repair of the temple are included in the law of being presented and appraised there is need therefore for our Simeon to explain that dedications for the repairs of the temple which died are redeemed but according to Rush Lakish what need is there for our Simeon to explain this let him say if they die they are redeemed Rush Lakish can answer you our Simeon did not know what the first tana in the Mishnah meant and this is what he said to him if you refer to dedications for the altar I agree with you if you Refer to dedications for the repairs of the temple if they die they are redeemed it has been taught according to our Yohan and scripture says and if it be any unclean beast of which they may not bring an offering the text refers to blemished animals which were redeemed you say that the text refers to blemished animals perhaps it is not so and it refers to an unclean animal when however it says and if it be of an unclean beast then he shall redeem it according to thy estimation the case of an unclean animal is thus already mentioned Talmud, Masti Mura how therefore do I explain the text and if it be any unclean beast of which they may not bring an offering unto the Lord it refers to blemished animals which were redeemed one might think that they may be redeemed on account of the transitory blemish the text however states of which they may not bring an offering thus referring to a sacrifice which is not offered at all to the exclusion of this which is not offered today but to Tomorrow maybe and the divine law says a sacrifice requires to be presented and appraised. Arhidal reported in the name of Rab what is the reason of Rush Lakish in saying that according to the rabbis dedications for the altar are included in the law of being presented and appraised whereas dedications for the repairs of the temple are not included in the law of being presented and appraised because scripture says and
of the temple are not because scripture says and the priest shall value it whether it be good or bad now what is the kind of dedication in which there is a difference between good and unblemished animal and bad blemished one you must admit it is dedications for the altar and scripture says it thus excluding the case of dedications for the repairs of the temple if so the text should read between good and bad this remains a difficulty and objection was raised if they die unblemished they are buried if blemished they are redeemed this refers only to dedications for the altar but dedications for repairs of the temple whether they are unblemished or blemished are buried are Simeon however says in the case of both dedication for the altar and dedication for the repairs of the temple if unblemished they are buried if blemished they are redeemed shall we say that this refutes our Yohanan from the first clause our Yohanan can answer you we are dealing here with an animal which became blemished from the beginning it also stands to reason for if you say that the cases where their dedication preceded their blemish why does not our Simeon dispute in that connection hence you must must you not say that the case here is of an animal blemished from the beginning but then are we to say that this refutes Rush Lakish Rush Lakish will explain the Berith as dealing with the case where their dedication was prior to their blemish if so let our Simeon dispute with reference to it Rush Lakish reverses the names of the authorities in the Berith and asks a question from another Berith as follows if they die whether unblemished or blemished they are buried this applies to dedications for the repairs of the temple but dedications for the altar are redeemed our Simeon says if they die unblemished they are buried if blemished they are redeemed shall we say that our Yohanan can be refuted from the latter clause of the teaching of the former Tan our Yohanan can answer you we are Dealing here with an animal blemish from the beginning it stands to reason for if you say that it is a case of where their dedication preceded the blemish why does not our Simeon dispute with reference to it shall we say that this refutes Rush Lakish Rush Lakish will answer you we are dealing here with a case where their dedication preceded their blemish but why does not our Simeon differ with reference to it Rush Lakish can answer you our Simeon does indeed differ set our Jeremiah to our Zerah. According to Rush Lakish who says that according to the rabbis dedications for the altar are not included in the law being presented and appraised since the Beritha above states with reference to dedications for the altar Talmud, Mosti Mirabi that blemished animals are redeemed and we explain this as being a case where dedications preceded their blemish may we infer from here that we may redeem disqualified dedicated animals in order to give them for food to dogs know the case. Here is where he transgressed and killed them before redemption as it has been taught as regards animals in which a blemish occurred and which he killed our Meir says they shall be buried whereas the sages say they are redeemed set our Jeremiah to our Zerah according to our Simeon who says that dedications for the repairs of the temple were not included in the law being presented and appraised why are unblemished dedicated animals buried it is because they are fit to be offered as it has been taught if one caused unblemished animals to be invested with the holiness of dedications for the repairs of the temple when they are redeemed for their value they can only be redeemed in order to be used on the altar since everything which is fit for use on the altar is never released from the lean of the altar set our Papa to Abe or according to another version to Rabba according to our Yohanan who explains the very the above as dealing with the case of an animal blemish from it. Beginning which would imply that all the authorities in the very the hold that an animal blemish from the beginning is not included in the law being presented and appraised is it indeed not included have we not learned all dedicated animals whose permanent blemish preceded their dedication if redeemed are subject to the law of the firstling and the priestly gifts they become hull and to be shorn and worked after their dedication their issue and milk are permitted after their dedication. If one kills them without the temple court he does not incur any guilt they do not affect exchange and if they die they are redeemed and Rab Judah reported in the name of Rab this is the teaching of our Simeon who says that dedications for the altar are included in the law being presented and appraised whereas dedications for the repairs of the temple are not as we have learned our Simeon says animals dedicated for the repairs of the temple if they die are redeemed but our Simeon admits that a Dedicated animal blemished from the beginning is redeemed. What is the reason scripture says it the word it excluding the case of a dedicated animal blemished from the beginning? The sages, however, say even a dedicated animal blemished from the beginning is also included in the law being presented and appraised. Yabe said to him, Our Papa, whose opinion do the sages represent that of the Tana of the school of Levi? If so, why does Rab say above this is the opinion of our Simeon and nothing? More should he not have said this is the opinion of our Simeon and the rabbis who differ from him? Yabe answered him, The reason why he Rab does not state this is because he holds the opinion of Rush Lakish who says that according to the rabbis, dedications for the repairs of the temple are included in the law being presented and appraised, whereas dedications for the altar are not the first clause of the cited mission saying, and if they die, they are redeemed, while the latter clause. Of the Mishnah says if they die they are buried and if you prefer another solution I may say Rab holds the opinion of our Yohanan and as for your difficulty that Rab should have stated this is the teaching of our Simeon and the rabbis who differ from him right here this is the opinion of our Simeon and the rabbis who differ from him Mishnah and the following are the things which are to be buried if a dedicated animal had an untimely birth it is to be buried if a dedicated animal had an after birth it is to be buried an ox which was condemned to be stoned a heifer whose neck was broken the birds brought in connection with the purification of a leper the hair of a Nazi right the first birth of an ass a mixture of meat and milk and hullin which were killed in the temple court our Simeon however says hullin which were killed in the temple court are to be burnt and likewise says our Simeon an animal of chase which was killed in the temple court is also burnt and the following are to be burnt leavened bread on Passover is to be burnt unclean terima or mixed seeds in the vineyard that which it is customary to burn is to be burnt and that which it is customary to bury is to be buried we may burn the bread and oil of unclean terima all dedicated animals which were killed with the intention of being eaten beyond the allotted time or beyond the allotted place are to be burnt Talmud, Mosim a guilt offering offered by one in doubt as to whether he has committed a sinful act is to be burnt Arjuda however says it is to be buried a sin offering of a bird that is brought for a doubt is burnt Arjuda however says it is cast into the sewer all things requiring to be buried must not be burnt and all things which require to be burnt must not be buried Arjuda says if one wishes to be stringent with himself to burn things which are buried he is permitted to do so they said to him it is not allowed to change him to be raised an objection to our Naman we have learned the hair of a Nazi right is buried this contradicts the following if one weaves the size of a sit from the wool of a firstling animal in a garment the garment is to be burnt if one weaves from the hair of a Nazi right and from the hair of the first birth of an ass in a sack the sack is to be burnt here Naman said to him Toby here we are dealing with a ritually unclean Nazi right and there we are dealing with a ritually clean Nazi right he Toby said to him our Naman you have accounted for the disagreement between the case of the hair of a Nazi right mentioned in our mission and the case of the hair of a Nazi right mentioned in the other but you have still to account for the difference between the teaching concerning the first birth of an ass in our mission and the teaching concerning the first birth of an ass mentioned in the other here Naman was at first silent and said nothing at all to him but thereupon he said to him have you heard Something with reference to this matter he Toby replied to him thus said our she's hate here we are dealing with a sack and there with hair it has also been stated said our Jose son of our Hannah here we are dealing with a sack and there we are dealing with hair our Eliezer says here we are dealing with a ritually clean Nazi right and there we are dealing with a ritually unclean Nazi right here Naman asked him why should not the forbidden hair be neutralized in the larger size of the sack said our Papa we suppose that he wove the figure of a bird if he indeed wove the figure of a bird why cannot he pull out the forbidden hair said our Jeremiah the side admission represents the view of our Judah who holds that if one wishes to be stringent with himself so as to burn the things which only require to be buried he is permitted to do so he said to him we ask why you should not pull out the forbidden hairs from the sack and you explain the side admission as representing the view of our Judah this is what I mean if it is possible to pull out the forbidden hair it is better but if not the side admission may be explained as representing the opinion of our Judah who says that if he wishes to be stringent with himself so as to burn things which only require to be buried he is permitted to do so and the following are to be burnt the master said leavened bread on Passover is burnt the tana of our mission states here anonymously the opinion of our Judah who said the
are always forbidden and the reason why the Tana in the Beritha here does not state both cases together is because Asherah can be made void by a heathen whereas consecrated objects can never be made void at any rate the Beritha states that the ashes of consecrated objects are always forbidden said Rami Biham the case here is where E.G. fire broke out of itself among consecrated would seeing that there was nobody who could be guilty of sacrilege for the ashes to become Hullan Arshmeya says. The Beritha above refers to the ashes which are separated and which are always forbidden to be used for it has been taught scripture says and he shall put it meaning he shall put it quietly he shall put it the whole of it the handful and he shall put it that he must not scatter it.